Hello, welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Yesterday is Chandler Lewis. Chandler, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Jason. I've been looking forward to this. So first one. So be honest with us, right? Yeah. There's no way you're a human, right? <laughs> like all this you got going on, you got to be a robot or Android, you don't sleep. There's no fucking way you're just a regular human being. You know, I get this question a lot and I think, you know, we'll get there today, but um, you know, my superpower is being neurodivergent and having ADHD. And so, you know, I feel like growing up, I didn't understand that. And now I recognize like there's, there's just some people that are built to always be going and I take breaks, but I'm, I'm really proud of where my team and, you know, where myself is have gotten so far. So, yeah. So what does that mean? What is the definition of neurodivergent? What is that? What is that? So, you know, when I, when, when we think about neurotypical people, you know, just, I guess what everybody would consider is kind of the norm. Um, you know, the, at least for me, you know, it's a spectrum, you know, so there's, you know, from neurotypical to, you know, neurodivergent, there's a number of different uh, spectrum disorders from autism, Asperger's, ADHD, dyslexia. Um, there's different types of ADHD. For me, you know, I have a combined type of ADHD um, and dyslexia. And so, you know, I struggled um, with, you know, reading and math in particular. Um, and, you know, later, I think, well, also, I just have a very active brain. So I like to chat a lot. Um, so, yeah, neurotypical, you know, neurodivergent, I would say, is is somebody that has been diagnosed with a spectrum disorder and for me that's ADHD and dyslexia which is probably on the milder spectrum of of neurodivergent disorders and is this like genetics you, you like you got this from your parents or like something you diagnosed like I mean we know that that um or at least so I guess I won't say I don't know I don't think you know I don't know if it runs in my family I'm adopted actually so okay um, you know, there's a lot of questions that are left unresolved in that. And I've tried to investigate as much as I could, but I don't really know. I assume it's probably genetic. Okay. And how old were you when you were diagnosed, diagnosed with this? <sighs> I was probably like not 10. Okay. I, I was probably like 10. I was in fifth grade. Okay. Um, or fourth grade. I was in fourth and I'm guessing the reaction back then was, oh my God, he has this thing. How is he going to adapt to life or... No, I mean, my parents, you know, I, fortunately, I have, you know, wonderful family and parents that, you know, my mom's a physician, um, nurse practitioner. And, um, you know, I'm sure I think, that helps some. Yeah, it did. It definitely did. You know, getting me the right type of doctor, you know, the right type of counseling or therapist, um, you know, the occupational therapy. I had a lot of mentors and tutors growing up. And are you still doing therapy now? You know, I've done a lot. I've done couples counseling with my husband and I um and you know that's over the last been together for 10 years now but over the last you know, three or four years we we have you know the COVID was difficult on everybody I yeah. think um for me it really manifested in the, like before COVID I was out you know I enjoy going to lots of networking events and you know still being out there and I still do I see you a lot too, Jason. But you know, the um, it was challenging to like be alone at home. You know, like my husband was was a um, first responder doing some research, uh, UW, you know, at the labs, um, and like I was just home alone. And so I think for me it was a difficult transition to go from, you know, having my full day kind of filled with things to not being able to even really leave and so that was really challenging for me and i had some things to work through with that um which i found out was a lot related to my adoption i think that i hadn't uncovered yet and maybe the fear of abandonment or being alone how, how old are you when your adoptive parents tell you you're adopted i think they were very open about it. i mean they're white <laughs> you know so um even before i think i had an awareness of of my own self identity. I had an awareness of color. Um, You're like, I don't look like them. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, they're, you know, my mom has red hair. My dad's got, you know, 
Like, we don't look the same. Yeah. Did my mom have a pair of the male men? No, I know. And I wonder, you know, I think those are always the questions that we ask ourselves. Like, what's it mean to be adopted? And, you know, like, did it, why? For me, I don't think there was ever really any question. They were, my parents were very. They knew they loved you. Yeah, completely. And they were open about my adoption. I know I have a half sister. Um, and after my 23 and me, I know I have a ton of family in, you know, the Texas area, which is, I was born in Corpus Christi. So okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So being near divergent, how have you been able to take advantage of that? You know, it's, it took a while for me to understand and be able to even structure, create a structure around how my ADHD presents. You know, it took a doctor, you know, one of my, one of my previous doctors at UW um, spent, you know, a year really going through different types of medications with me, um, you know, and seeing how they responded, um, because they're not all the same. You know, I've been on probably five or six different ADHD medications. And so I think until I found what worked for me, which is just generic Adderall, um, I wasn't really even able to be a hundred percent me. Um, you know, some people, I think a lot of people don't understand, but when I take medication, it, it's like, you know, ADHD is, is an overstimulation of things going on. There's so many things that are drawing our attention. Um, and for me, it just, you know, helps quiet those, all those other things going on that really has this year, these last two years allowed for a lot of personal growth. Um, intentional, thoughtful processes, you know, starting things from start to finish. I'm a huge fan of the checklist manifesto, you know, um, because that's like, I have to follow the process and that structure. And I think that's really what's allowed me to, connect with the superpower of being able to manage and, you know, take steps towards a vision that I have for the work that our team's doing. And were you raised here in Seattle? I wasn't. I was raised in a little town in Eastern Washington called OMAC. Okay. Um, my, my grandparents, or my mom was raised in OMAC um, and, you know, moved to Texas were there for 20 years then I was born and moved back when I was about seven or eight so I grew up in a tiny town uh, about 6,000 people in about 90 minutes north of Chelan okay um in the Okanagan Valley and partly on the Colville Reservation um so yeah it was you know we had a ranch 150 acre ranch country living yeah I had horses you know I grew up all the pictures of you on you know, in, in fields or on the back of a horse growing up. And that, that is certainly something that, um, that's a privilege, you know, to be able to have that. And um, I'm very thankful for that. Here's a question for you. I've been asking recently. So you grew up in a rural area. So to me, honestly, like, no matter, like, to me, like, no matter how economic disadvantaged you are, if you live like in Seattle, big city, you have some kind of advantage, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's better Wi-Fi here, all that kind of stuff. Oh my God, the Wi-Fi, yes, it's true. Where rural areas you know, don't have that, right? How do we, like, equalize that, right? How do we get, like, people in the rural areas the same amount of opportunities here? Or as a matter of fact, hey, if you live in country town, Texas, you know, you want to do this tech stuff, you got to move to Dallas, Austin, a big city. Or is there a way to, like, equalize that? Of course, we can equalize some with totally. COVID and Zoom and stuff, but no. You know, I think we're really at the advent of, like, digital learning and upskilling. You know, I as as a recent you know founder of a company B team labs technologies that really focuses on uh, one of our you know key areas is education i've been thinking about this question a lot you know uh, giving a shout out to some of the teams that you know we work with at 360 social impact studios you know i can think of people that are tackling this problem like Kledge um or future jet you know eddie i think you've interviewed eddie here before and yeah shout out to eddie he does some great things yeah, Eddie, Eddie, Mr. Building Public, Public himself. Yes. And so, you know, I think these questions really are being asked, like, how do we connect rural and indigenous, you know, places with opportunity? For me, 
there wasn't, you know, my parents had to pay a lot of money to expose me to those experiences by traveling and by bringing in tutors and by going to a private school for K through, you know, for like third through eighth, um, learning Latin, you know, um, having those, like, I always had summer reading. Yeah, my, my parents always made me do those. Um, played piano for 13 years. I think those are the experiences that have shaped me that so many people don't, you know, even sports, like my sports coaches, tennis, golf, baseball, um, soccer, you know, um, these are these are things that have helped shape and provide me with the skills that I have now. I was in scouts too. I'm an Eagle Scout, by the way. So I credit a lot of that. So so was Eddie. Eddie's Eagle yeah. Scout too. Yeah. So, you know, I think um I'm I really look forward to and I, I appreciate what COVID has done now in thinking about the future of, you know, connection. Think about telemedicine, you know, the advancements that we've made there and connection and the investments in broadband technology that Washington State is making, um, you know, with connecting, you know, and even Comcast in, in their investments in rural, um, you know, infrastructure. So I think first it takes that investment. You know, I was just in Australia with the governor, um, um, Governor Inslee, on a two-week mission, trade mission and, and study. Um, and they're struggling with the same challenges there in connecting their northern territories with educational opportunities, innovation, um, access, you know. And so I don't know if we've solved it yet, but I think there's a lot of exciting technologies and brilliant founders that are trying to bridge that opportunity gap. Um, and hopefully, you know, if anybody's interested, we build on Open edX. Um, our company builds on Open edX, and, you know, we really are on a mission to democratize access to education. I think a big challenge too is, and I could be totally wrong about this, like, suppose like, there's like a 13 year old kid out there somewhere, you know, Cowtown, you know, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And like, he's like, man, I want to learn how to do chat, be telling doing this tech stuff, right? But the parents are like, hey kid, you know, like, we got to milk those cows at four in the morning, right? You can do it after all your chores are done, right? Which means yeah. like, he has no time to do it, right? Is it, so it's a matter of like kind of educating those parents, like, hey, you know, you can get involved on tech, this, you can improve your farm kind of some kind of way, or like, how do you overcome that? You know, I don't, I don't know if there's an easy way to solve that. Like families, you know, I grew up on a farm, so I know what it's like to wake up, you know, three or four times a night to drive out and get on a snowmobile and look for cow cows that have, you know, had their babies in between the winter, you know, and it's so like, I get it. And, you know, you still, again, it's privilege. Some people don't have the privilege to step away. It's not just on a farm. I think of the businesses that we work with. Um, here in Washington State through programs like Rise, like yeah. they can't step away. Yeah, how many people you know, like high school juniors, they have to work work to McDonald's after school to help support the family. A lot, you know. I mean, the a lot of people, most people, I think, have to work um, to support themselves through school. I worked all four years of college, both undergraduate and graduate. Um, you know, and so did my parents. You know, and I think that's, but that's still a privilege to be able to um you know do both i think yeah i agree and for the audience real fast like all this stuff we're talking about channeling like like that thing we just talked about that would probably take a whole two hours by itself yeah, right true so we're gonna talk a lot of stuff with channeler that broke it down could easily be a two-hour podcast by itself we're gonna so we're gonna try to give it like a part of a 30 foot overview a lot of let's go let's let's go there yeah. you know i'm ready so next talk about your trip to australia with the governor <sighs> that had to be an exciting experience i don't know I yeah sent you, i sent you a link and said hey dude I know you're doing some stuff, man, but please take the time to enjoy, enjoy this, what you're doing over I'm there. so glad you did. I, I took a little bit of a senior skip day because, um, like, you know. So you don't go to Australia every day. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, this was this was a really cool trip. I have to, um, you know, just say thank you to the Washington State Department of Commerce, um, you know, Carl Dahlgren, um, you know, Tammy and Nicole, um, you know, just such an incredible team that, you know, I think, Seattle is a small enough community that the people that see what you're doing and, and value that work really put opportunities or help create opportunities. And so that's really where it started, you know, working with the Department of Commerce and having opportunity through the STEP grant. So part of that, they reached out and asked, um, you know, if I would be interested in going as a part of the delegation to 
Australia. And of course, I wanted to said yes, you know, the step grants available. So we get, um, you know, up to $10,000 a year to use towards travel um, or, cert, you know, uh, market research, um, um, you know, consulting help from the commerce's partners around the country or around the world. Um, and I invited a few teams, you know, that we had. So I invited Margie uh, Benching of uh, Golden Sherpa, um, Evan Wasik, who's our partner at Litmus, um, and um, Will Kledgern, um, from Preveal Technologies. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it. Uh, and Carol um, Robinson from Medato Health, who also um, it was a little bit of a success emergency, but they got a contract and she wasn't able to uh, make it because they were finalizing negotiations. So Margie, Evan, and I did make the trip. And it was one of the most incredible opportunities and experiences I think that I've been on. Not many people get the privilege to go with you know an elected official no less the longest serving governor in the United States, um, to, to this type of opportunity. So it felt really VIP. <laughs> and what was the intent of this trip? Was it for the government like bringing more trade from Australia to Seattle or? Was yeah, so it was just really, you know, the last time Washington State did a, um, a trade visit was 17 years ago. Um, and That's so that's kind of unbelievable, God isn't it? it? When you think about you know Boeing and you know and Amazon and Microsoft, all the work that Do you think that'd be at least a yearly thing somewhere, like some somewhere country, each country each year pick a different country to go to. Yeah, that's, that's, and that's crazy. Our relationship with Australia is really strong. Um, you know, there's so much trade between the APEC regions um, and Washington State, and so um, he was there mostly for you know the governor is really squarely focused on sustainability and renewable energy. Um, I sat through a lot of presentations on sustainable air fuel, uh, hydrogen, um, you know, the, uh, it, a little, a lot of stuff that Evan, my partner was probably more interested than me. Um, and so I got to skip out and on Tuesday while we were there, um, because they were all focused on, you know, 95%, 98% of the delegation was focused on sustainable energy. We got to take a little side trip with nice. Nicole Gunkel to um, Brisbane, and we were the Washington State delegation that um, went to Brisbane. And so, like our first meeting, and thank goodness for um, you know Hop Hop Good Gammon, um, the lawyers there uh, who just put together an incredible roundtable. It was like twenty five, you know, different um, organizations and. Um, ecosystem partners that they introduced to us there. We then later went to, it's called the Precinct uh, in River, River City Labs, um, which is a huge innovation space that's sub subsidized largely by the government um, inside of an innovation precinct, uh, which has universities, it has industry, and it has um, like um, a lab space. Uh, and so from there, we uh, they also have the XR hub there, the extended reality hub, and they have the AI hub. Um, and then we went over to the Translational Research Institute, which was incredible. You know, I had been to Brazil earlier this year with Commerce down to Hospitalar, and we saw the Einstein Clinic, which was impressive. But this building, you know, 3,000 seat lab, uh, 800 seats were went to uh, Thermo Fisher, with which has shared labs within the space, and they really are bringing. They have five universities that are represented there. So I came back with so many, you know, it was just overwhelming. And actually, the Dr. Aaron Evans, the CEO of Life Science Queensland, invited me up for the weekend with her husband and family to go to the Extended Reality or the Explore Conference in the Sunshine Coast. Oh wow. Um, and so it was like she founded the Australia's Extended Reality Advisory Hub. So it was like an even more exclusive, you know, event that I finished the trip a little bit early, flew back up to Brisbane, rented a car, drove up the Sunshine Coast and spent the weekend with her and her family at this mind blowing conference. I can't imagine but it must have been an outstanding experience for you. Just like great experience. It was you know, it's just such an honor to be out there being able to represent not just Washington State, but, you know, the, 
the founders that are doing some really cool work with our with our community and it's exciting to think about the future of what that means for us so talk about this some and i might be thinking of something else you did but like it's not like you just like went there willy-nilly right like you think <laughs> about the detailed planning that went into you going on this trip like you yeah realize like like this stuff you have to do right There's okay like studying details like i mean i saw your plan was there for this or something else it's like oh wow like yeah this was, was detailed stuff. no absolutely so you know think one of the things that we do at 360 um and something that my team is becoming known for is our work in international markets um all of our team has worked overseas um at some point um largely you know ac across the globe from india you know to um, the middle east to europe um, africa and so you know I think what we bring is a process of actually thinking about how does the product that we have, how will this translate to other markets? You know, what do we need to know about the culture, the demographics, you know, um, the, the spending power, the buying patterns, you know, the, the values system that another culture, another, you know, market has before you really target it. So things that we did, you know, it's, I think we, when you came to our workshop, we mentioned we had just um, finalized or our finalizing agreement with the seed group, which is the uh, Royal family's office in the UAE. And they made us go through an extensive market process, which informed the work we did before we went to Australia. Um, we had targeted the industries that we wanted to target. So for us, it was oil and gas, petrochemicals, sustainable energy. And then we started thinking about who are the big players that we want to meet um, and kind of doing summaries of those companies, um, how many employees they have. Then we looked at um, their, their technology readiness for um, assisted reality or mixed reality technology. So, you know, places like Toyota or Boeing or Airbus, you know, they're already digitizing, um, you know, creating simulation extended reality for some of their, you know, training and development already. Um, and so these were kind of our initial way that we segmented everything. You've seen our spreadsheet, our Excel sheet. Um, and then after that, we kind of uh, went through and prioritized them. Yeah, well, those out there, you might think you're detailed, but trust me, you're not detailed until you're on channels that were detailed. So uh, people, you know, I do get, I, I get a lot of comments from our market representatives that yeah. we work with that it's, it's really good work for them. So yeah, you just, you just showed them like, okay, this, this, these people have done their homework, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're here prepared. They're not here bullshitting around. They're like here yes. to do some work. Yeah. And that definitely shows. Well, all of our teams have come back from trips that we've gone on with tremendous amounts of business, you know? Um, even me from this last trip, like, you know, we're already, I signed nine letters of commitment and have two, um, discussions about pilots going on right now. So it's, it was good. So with all the stuff you have going on, like, how do you prioritize? Cause obviously everything is important to different people, whatever, but how do you prioritize? This is hard for me. I think like, you know, I, so you can't have priority no. one, a one B one C. No. I'm let, let me say I'm very ambitious. You know, I feel like I'm at the point in my life where I've never felt more ambitious. Um, and to me that manifests by prioritizing the things like this year, it's been building the foundation of 360, getting our entrepreneurs and residents, getting, you know, our program set, you know, piloting our core curriculum, um, you know, getting, building an ecosystem of partners and supporters and curriculum. Um, and so every day, you know, like I, I wrote two proposals this week, over a hundred pages of content in the last seven days. Yeah, so you did it yourself. Like you didn't like, you didn't like delegate to no one. No, I called it, I call them ADHD God moments. Okay. <laughs> it's like, we're in the flow of just going for it. So to speak. Yeah. Uh, the innovation cluster grant, uh, we submitted a, a, a large application for the um, Washington State Commerce uh, Innovation Cluster Grant for the Mixed Reality 4.0. So in, Industry 4.0 plus Mixed Reality. 
Uh, we're partners with DigiLens and RealWare. Um, and so the, these, you know, as, as our two core technology partners, we're really excited to kind of yeah. build on those. Um, so, you know, the priority also, I would say this year, and unfortunately, my founders have had to take a little bit of a pause from some of our team because it really has been our biggest priority, has been the launching of our venture fund. Um, and so any time that I've had work on that, that's always come, that's jumped the line. Um, and then I have a full-time job. So like I am usually in the office like nine to five. I don't know. Um, we're going to have to like take a knife out and cut you <laughs> and make sure you bleed because I don't believe you. It's no, it's no fucking way. Yeah. Work. <laughs> so my, I like, I'm required to be in the office from nine to five, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Are you serious? Um, yeah. So like I actually, and I have two, you know, I have two others on my team. I have a health equity project mm -hmm. manager and a health equity project coordinator at the cross cultural health. The inside of your brain must be fucking bananas. Dude, my, my organized, it's, it's about system, you know, I think. There's probably plenty of quotes that we could find that say, like, give, you know, put a great system in place and you can do oh, yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right? I, I believe in that. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, ADHD, like my superpower is putting systems together. Um, maybe they don't always work the first time because other people but should use them. Yeah, but, but like, um, you know. I've automated a lot of the work that I do. Um, and ChatGPT has made it like, I wrote that proposal in two days with, with ChatGPT. Okay. But you have to know what you want yeah. first. Yeah, I, I really said like, before I was like, ChatGPT, this is like, just Google Plus, the fuck is now, I, okay. Now I'm learning how to use it more, like accurately more, like you gotta be more detailed. Okay, yeah. okay, now I see it, now I see it, right? Yeah. I started using it too, right? Oh shit, this is like game changer. It's a, I, I doubled my productivity. I was good or bad, but I, was, I did. I was going to ask you, like, you wrote these 100-page documents. Like, how did you proofread it, right? So I, I guess in ChatBT did it for you. Well, I am blessed. One thing that I used to do in college, probably, you know, hopefully this doesn't blow anybody's <laughs> cup of here, but I used to write essays for friends and stuff. Okay. Um, because I'm I'm really fast writer. Um, maybe that's one I'm of my I guess your grammar's power. really good, too. Yeah, I was, yeah, like my know, Like, my grammar, like, sucks. I don't believe in punctuation. I, like, yeah. I took, actually, so I, I have a degree in English and political science, or political science and economics, but my, but I have 55 credits of English. I took English just for fun because I loved writing in, in college, so. But I didn't want to take, I'm one credit away from a, a, a degree in English, but I did not want to take Rise of the English Novel. Okay. Um. It was my last quarter, and they were like, "Who who was your favorite favorite writer?" But, that's kind of a tough question. Maybe no, some I mean, I, I've 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 read a lot, so um, that's really hard. Um, For me, it's always been like Voltaire. Always been a fan of Voltaire. Always liked him. Oh well, I mean, you know, I don't know if you. I'm sure you've heard of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think so there's, good. you know, I I. I read a lot of history, nonfiction, you know, um, and I collect a lot of books, but I don't read them from start, to, you know, the, yeah. from cover to cover. I think, um, let's come back to, let me think of okay, that. Okay. I'm also very, I'm, I'm bad with names and titles. So I can no think word. of like books though, that are my favorite, like flowers for Algernon, mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite books. Um, you know, I, that that message of, yeah they put the mic for you sorry that um that message yep. was um you know so here's, here's one for you. this has like been a meme on TikTok recently where it's mainly for females right and they're like i suppose like every man thinks about the woman empire like at least once a week right mm -hmm. it's just crazy like how the woman empire all this time ago still has an impact you know like and most men, like, I have a, like, this is a woman, so I received an mm -hmm. award when I left a gay job. I have a tattoo to my leg, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a big fan of women history. Yeah. It's crazy, like, how most men, at least most men I know, like, still think about the Roman Empire, even though it's, like, thousands of years ago, right? This is insane, I think. I mean, you know, the, the, um, there's a reason why I think that we look to those types of, you know, and, and, and hold those maybe that imagery that those values is kind of the golden standard yeah. in many ways. You know, I think we think about, you know, how the state of our politics yeah. and our society has degraded over the last few years. 
um, you know, socially. Yeah. I think that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's one of the reasons I wanted to go back and read, you know, Marcus Aurelius, you know, and think about what are those value and actually virtues, right? Because um, in in the book, it says, you know, values are something that people have. And, you know, I think maybe it was the, maybe it was the war, the um, Japanese, what did they call it? Um, the warriors. What's oh, um, samurai. Samurais. Maybe it was them that said, you know, that virtues are values with consistent action, right? <laughs> and I think that's really um, how I like, why I think a lot of people go back and hold those things up because there are, you know, at least great stories of people sticking to those. And I remember, I remember reading this, right? I'm assuming it's true, but the story I read, like, they were able to trace back, you know, the the, the railroad tracks, the side of the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. This they backtracked all the way back to the Roman chariot because mm -hmm. the Roman chariot, the, the size of two butts of the horses, yeah. had to fit this road. Mm -hmm. And then now train tracks are still following the same method. It's like it's crazy. I mean, right? I you know that's even you know the chariots even go back to like the Egyptians, like mm -hmm. three thousand, four thousand years ago. Um, but I was just in Greece, you know, and there's a lot of little islands, of course, all over Greece. Um, and, you know, there are some islands where you can see, you know, the, those tracks still leading out of, yeah. um, you know, the water levels risen, but you can, there are still evidence of those tracks and they're the same size all over the world. Right. I mean, Rome built world roads all over the world. Yeah. Or, or say all roads lead to Rome or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And, and then with the, with the Romans, um, man, I lost my track of thought. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so next. Two part question. Is there like a um, accepted definition of underrepresented uh, uh, communities? And what is your definition of underrepresented communities? You know, first of all, I want to say that I, you know, do not speak for all underrepresented communities. Um, but my personal definition would be somebody that has um, historically lacked access or intentionally been, you know, restricted access or opportunity um, to education, healthcare, um, you know, um, high paying jobs, education, you know, what those, those you know, then the things that, that we depend on to thrive, right? So things that humans depend on, like being lacked or being, you know, uh, deprived of those resources. Um, and it's not something I think we choose, you know, people don't, it's not a choice. Like we are sometimes people are born into, you know, um, into persistent, you know, cycles of um, poverty and, you know, health disparities and inequality, right? Yeah, I think birth definitely has a lot to do with it, right? What? I think birth definitely has a lot to do. With, totally. You, know, you don't choose. I, I was, I'm one of the lucky ones, you know, Jason, like I was born to a family that did not have those resources. Had, had my parents not been the one to get the call, you know, then my life could have been very different. And so like, I, I really am acutely aware and have been raised with knowing that, you know, these deci one decision you know, has really changed the entire trajectory of my life. I mean, if someone's born, like we're saying, South Lake Carroll, Dallas, with a bunch of millionaire homes, that's way better than if you're born, like, you know, I'm saying, like Appalachian Mountains or South totally. Carolina, right? But then again, like, you know, you want to be born in Appalachian Mountains, South Side of Chicago or in North Korea, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, these are all toss-ups. I mean, I think, you know, something that's really powerful is like the, um, our zip code is actually a stronger predictor of life expectancy than almost yeah. any other determinant, yeah. right? Um, and in Chicago, you know, they did a study a couple of years ago showing that, um, you know, a, there are two communities 1.3 miles apart had a 14 year living ex yeah. life expectancy difference. Um, you know, those those are things that we in a developed country still deal with. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people don't realize this, you know, America's great and all, but they're still part of the country we're like, man. This is a third world country right here. Like it feels like yeah, it sometimes. Like potholes everywhere, like no Wi-Fi, you know, like just trash everywhere. Like 
and no, you know, the housing, bridges right? Are falling, housing is falling apart. Like, is this America or is this like, you know, some third world country somewhere? You know, it's really interesting. My husband is from Taiwan um, and grew up, you know, was born in Columbus, Ohio, but um, so, you know, American, which maybe we will get into later. But, um, you know, and when he, we often talk about, you know, like, do we want to stay here? You know, fortunately, I've traveled and I have seen other places, but, you know, Daniel was surprised, I think, coming to the U.S. and seeing how so many of the, the challenges that, you know, their their country has solved, public, you know, public education, public transportation, edu- you know, access to health care, um, you know, s- strong quality of living, uh, affordable housing. Um, you know, I think that, you know, are, it makes me feel bad, you know, like what, why can't we achieve that? You know, going to Australia, seeing, yes, there's issues, you know, I think staffing is a challenge across the globe, you know, having enough workforce, but the infrastructure's there, you know? Um, and so I do sometimes come back to the U.S. and I think this is really kind of shitty. Yeah, <laughs> like, um, and I, you know, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say that, you know, maybe in the next few years, I would look to one of the places that were, you know, opening an office to move to. Um, you know, there's, there are, I would love to be able to get on a train in the morning, you know, and just show up. That, with, that's one thing to me, just what I'm saying, like, I, you know, I was in the army, I lived in Europe, different place, right? In Europe, you catch a train, it'd be anywhere, like in an hour, right? Yeah. You no know, more than here, it's 10 times the cost, 10 times the whatever, you know. It's not even clean. No, no. it takes like eighteen thousand days to go from from Seattle yeah. to LA. You know, it's it's just it's you know, it's a, it's an issue. I mean, it's a, you know, my husband commutes. Uh, I don't know how he does it. You know, because every day, two and two three hours just to avoid driving. But um, it shouldn't. We shouldn't have to make those decisions. Yeah, it was, it was kind of bad. Like Seattle. Probably has one of the better public transportation across the United States. Or they'd be easy bottom ten percent anywhere. Well, the world. East Coast has pretty good, you know, rail and transit. Really? Um, I mean, what's your opinion on like, um, you know, like electric cars? I, I'm a big believer in them. I, I think, yeah. I mean, I think we. I, I still think we have to like. I think you need to have a gas car, electric car. You know, right? Because what happens? All electricity goes out, right? Yeah. Or what happens? You no, know, there's like a, you know, the grid gets terrorized okay. or vandalized, right? You know. I mean, I it's, it happens. You do. I think you need a gas. I think you need one of each, right? I mean, think about what happened in Hawaii after the fires. No power. Yeah. You know, um, in the winter, you know, it's hard and, to. And of course, all the conspiracy theories. Oh, the government wants they won't have electric cars, so they can like, you know, control you and tell you when you have problems and stuff. You know. Yeah, you know, I don't all know that, about all that, that. All that crazy stuff. You know. <laughs> I'm looking forward to maybe getting a hydrogen car mm-hmm. in the future. Yeah. You know, if we can get that technology affordable, you know, that is. I mean, the out product of that is water. Yeah. Right. So like. I think we still have to figure out the sound piece because <laughs> like, I don't know about anybody else, but I want it, even if it's fake sound, I still, I don't want to drive a silent car. Oh yeah. There's something about American muscle car, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, the boom, boom, you know, you know, yeah. the sticks and stuff. There's something like, like that's really good about that. Yeah. I've been a little bit spoiled with my car choices. So I have to say I've, I've enjoyed a nice gasoline engine, Yeah. Um, all German cars. So. Yeah, I, I, we've had a BMW for a while. There's nothing like it, you know. Yeah. But I've driven a Tesla before too. Like, oh shit, this is. I drove nice a too. Tesla. It was nice. Very nice, yeah. But I just, I, I just got a new car. Uh, it's lease. I lease, so I had to get a new car. It wasn't like I'm out there, you know, um, going crazy. But I did, you know, I did get a new Mercedes. Okay. Um, and I've never owned a Mercedes. I always thought that they were, you know, my grandparent, you know, grandparents drive them. Yeah. And they, they're like boats, you know. Uh-huh. They, but. I, I immediately fell in love with it. And I, you know, and I really don't feel bad about it at all because like I work 15, 16 hours a day. Yeah. I work, my work is focused on serving other people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I donated nearly 20,000 last year to my own nonprofit to support our team, our space. So like, you know, it, when I walk outside in the morning, when I get in that car, it makes me realize that if you want to have this life, you have to work for it. Yeah. 
And so for me, it's the one thing my husband doesn't drive. So it's my, it is the only thing that's really <laughs> mine. Um, and it really puts a smile on my face when I get in it. And that's what motivates me. Nice. So I have no reason to want this, but I don't want a cyber truck, right? Oh, they're, they're, I, I they're pretty cool. Did you see the commercial that this morning was, I think I saw it on X, um, the, the, Tesla tr or the cyber what is the cyber truck. the cyber truck was towing the Porsche a the Porsche 911 and yeah and still beat it that was pretty cool yeah um but would you really like drive one I probably would I mean I don't know I mean <laughs> that's the question right yeah because I have expedition it's tough to find parking in Seattle you know there's only yeah. like three parking my garages. parents had one there's only three parking garages so you can park in Seattle yeah expedition you know yeah this one looks like that you just want it because you want it right you really have no there's like, there's no need for it, you know, like, <laughs> I can't imagine what the need for a cyber truck would be. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, I think these are sometimes I wish maybe for a big time hunter or camping person, you know, maybe something like that, you know, it's cool. stuff. Yeah. It's, it's maybe what we'll drive on Mars when he gets us there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, um, I'm, I, there's other things that I think we could be doing with, uh, this type of innovation than building yeah. things That's that true. nobody wants. Yeah. So back to underrepresented community, yeah. right? Should that be based on like, you know, previous generations, what they went through, should be based on like, you know, race or color or educational level, should be based on like current economic situations. Like for example, I'll use like, I don't know why, but say, say Dak Prescott, right? Corbett Cowboys, he's a millionaire, 10 times older. Like, should his kid, he has a kid coming in like next year. Should that kid be automatically part of underrepresented community or she somebody from like Appalachian? Yeah, Mountains. okay. Population balance got like it. dirt poor, so has no access to education because they're underrepresented. So a or, number or, or is that a change in definition based on situation? No, a number of a number of people can have different identities. I mean, these intersectionalities, like I have I hold a lot of privilege because of my socioeconomic status, because of my education, but I still am a person of color and 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 I'm gay, you know, and I am, you know, have have I guess, you know, I don't call it a disability, but I have a disability, you know? And so like, these are, these, those aspects of my identity are underrepresented. You know, when we think about how many, you know, African-American, black, indigenous, LGBTQ people do we see in, you know, in, at Amazon, in their seniority, in Microsoft, you know, at Techstars, um, you know, or any, any of these, you know, kind of examples, we have to look at and say, what is diversity? or what is underrepresented. And we're trying to kind of define that ourselves too and thinking, you know, how do we identify and recognize that underrepresented can look like a lot of different things. You know, having the having conversations with people and asking them, you know, share your experience with me. I don't I try not to classify, uh, you know, like when we say you know, BIPOC, like I identify as BIPOC, my husband's Asian, he doesn't identify as BIPOC. You know, um, I was teaching a class the other day and somebody identified, they were like, oh, like, we don't use gay anymore, we say queer. I was like, I I certainly don't identify with that. And that's one thing, like, you know, I'm a straight guy, that's to me a challenge, like, all these, like, all these definitions, they change, like, on a daily basis. Right? Yeah. There's another letter to LBT. Oh my gosh. There's it's another pronoun, you know, there's like, like there's like a gender world now that I had no idea about. It's like, it's like, to me, it's like too much, right? Like I just call people by their name. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, like I don't, it's not that I don't care about those things, but you know, I work in this, I'm a health equity trainer. So like, and I'm, you know, I, a, a lot of health departments, you know, universities, you know, um, are clients of mine and I do trainings regularly and people ask the same question, you know, and it's like hard for them to see that, many people can have, you know, different identities that we're not one type of person. It doesn't, you know, not one size fits all. And so um, it's definitely, you know, the, the pronoun thing, the gender thing, you know, this, it's, it's hot topic right now. I don't know why, like, why does any of this matter? I remember recently on, on X, like this person got unhinged because they're like, I'm tired of going to my meetings and, and my and they were the first like my pronouns on on the Zoom screen, right? But they just keep on calling by my name. I'm yeah. like, what? Like, and stuff like that. Okay, it's important to you. Obviously, it's important to you because you're going around about it. But like, yeah, they call you by your name. I deal with that. So I write 
Chandler Lewis, he, him, neurodivergent as my, you know, as my kind of pronouns. Um, and, you know, I think I, I get it. We are going through a time when people are being told, you know, that they need to identify as, you know, have a very unique identity and, you know, and like, and we have to integrate that into our lives, which is valuable. You know, I'll use a good example. When I was in Australia, every single meeting, every single event, every, you know, speech, performance, path, bike pathway, you know, side of a building had indigenous land acknowledgements. You know, they did them like every meeting we had. We just want to acknowledge that we're on the indigenous land of XYZ. We and we want to recognize their contributing contribution, to, you know, um, and it was like so normalized, you know, and so it made me really question why we're having such a big issue here. It's not hard to acknowledge somebody else's humanity. It's not hard to acknowledge their identity. Apparently, it's hard to acknowledge people's history, right? Um, we're struggling with that now, you know, um, but it shouldn't be that way, you know? And so if it makes, you know, we can't make everybody feel better, but what the government of Australia has done is they said, you know, it's going to be the norm for organizations and individuals to come up with their own, whatever works for them, but you have to do it. And that behavior change has normalized it. Not everybody agrees, but it is the right thing to do. So the best pronoun thing I saw was like yesterday, I was on this panel on LinkedIn. This guy's a black guy. I think he's a professor of something in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. His pronoun was uh, he, him, I am a king. You know, I mean, sometimes I wonder if those things like, how, what the intention of them yeah. are done for. Yeah. You know, um, because I think that other people could see that and be offended by it. You know, like it, do you, is that really your pronoun? I, I don't really care. Again, like, call yourself what you want, you know, but um, don't infringe on the right of other people to have that for themselves either. Yeah. Right. So I remember the question I asked you, right? So we were talking about Marcus Aurelius, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people still study his stuff, right? Thousands of years ago, right? Mm -hmm. so the question is, like, like, obviously, tech has gotten better, right? If we begin a time, like, fire is part of tech, now tech is getting better and better. But has human channels gotten better or is this like we're carrying tech, right? Because like. Has human tech? No, has human intelligence gotten better? Or are we still the same smartness as back in the beginning of time? We're the same that we ha were back in time. But we've created tools that allow us to unlock pieces of ourselves that were not previously available to us. Um, or it took much longer to. I think with the advent of technology and it, it's information becomes easier to gather faster. You know, my grandmother is 103 years old, you know, so I just saw her over Thanksgiving. And when I think about, you know, we talk about it going back to, you know, the Romans. Well, you know, even a hundred years ago, there wasn't nearly the technology, the how, you know, like penicillin, you know, um, or, you know, phones, you know, like there's just not a lot of the things that we rely on every day. So I think the challenges, human challenges haven't changed either. I mean, let's be real. What's going on right now between Israel and Palestine, we've been reading about in the Bible for thousands of years. Yep, I know, right? You know, so what makes, what makes us today think that that is what, we, whatever we're doing is going to change? Just not. I mean, unless... Someone has a mindset change 180 degrees. It's, I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know how, you know, the, it's to me, it's not about religion or, you know, it, it's really, I mean, we, we are crafting as America, we are crafting a narrative and supporting things that we want to in the world. And it's not like our own government and many, you know, decades past have acknowledged that we, we have dropped cash, you know, from airplanes into, you know, like we have initiated regime change, yeah. 
you know, we did yeah, need that more. Our hands are not clean. No, and and the world recognizes that, right? I can't tell. I had cabbies, like, tell me very bluntly, T- please tell your governor, you know, while I was in Australia, like, please tell your governor, like, you must, like, Australia does not agree with what the United States is doing. They were the only ones that prevented the ceasefire vote, you know, at the UN. And that was really profound, I think, in seeing, you know, the challenges that we're dealing now could be solved, or maybe couldn't be solved, but they could be mitigated. Um, And I think a lot of it comes down to money. It's a machine. You've been in it. You've seen seen where money goes. I mean, people don't realize this, like, you know, in the Spanish America War, 1896, whatever it was, mm-hmm. you know, Spanish controlled the Philippines, the Spanish left, the Philippines thought we were an independent nation, and we came out, no, you're not. And we're just like, yeah. colonized again, like, we did, did like horrific things to them. I took a class on it, right? Yeah. Uh, the Filipino insurrection or something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we did some horrible things to people, right? You know, totally. I mean, even here things. in the U.S. with the, you know, Trail of Tears. Yeah. And the Japanese internment camps. Totally. I mean, we bombed like the Tulsa, African American community, the Tulsa, like, we did some horrible things. And we, we do it, you know, it's interesting how la- it all comes down to language. You know, I was having this conversation with my husband um, on the way back from Thanksgiving, you know, how it's, it's, what's the difference between women and children? What, like, what's, what, do, what do we as humans, the change that we make in how we think about them between immigrants, migrants, and refugees, or between um, you know, collateral damage and genocide, right? Like, you know, in it, it, the difference between war and like, you know, it like prisoners or, you know, terrorists and freedom fighters. Yeah. Right. I mean, what's, what really, you know, because when we change these labels on things and we can do it, you know, people, you know, powers that be politics, the media change words all the time to, to lessen the impact of things. Yeah, so I'm from Texas too, right? Born and raised. Mm-hmm. And of course, you grew up in Texas, you hear about the Texas independence, the mm-hmm. Texas, all right? So in college, I took a class based on that from the Mexican side, right? Mm-hmm. And a totally, totally different narrative, you know, the Mexican side, we know we're, we're gonna crush these rebels, you know. Tri-star state, they've yeah. had rich history. Yeah, we, we've taken, we give them these texts, all this stuff, now they're rebelling against us. And it's a totally different dynamic, right? Yeah. It's always interesting when, you know, Americans would do well to go to, you know, study one year in a different country. Um, because it's incredible what we learn when our history is taught back to us from a different perspective. Yeah. Like, you know, I was in Vietnam in September a few days, right? And mm-hmm. me and my friend went to the, they call it the, the American War Museum. Mm-hmm. And like, of course, you know, it's one side, it's from the Vietnam side. It, it, it had all the stuff, like the Malay mask, all the stuff you did bad about it. But of course, they don't say the bad things they did, right? Same with America. Our museums probably see all the bad things Vietnam do, right? There's no, it seems like there's no balance thing out there, right? Like, both sides do horrible things. Of course. I mean, that is, you know, if we even go back to, you know, like the, um, the Leviathan, you know, and think about, like, the state of nature and the state of war, you know, like, we we certainly have progressed to the place where, you know, we are, like, we are killing each other over property and, you know, valuables and values too, um, you know, and, and staking claims on things that may not necessarily be ours. Um, and what, and it's, it's really challenging concepts of power. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, you know, we always say, as humans always say, oh, never again, right. With the Holocaust, never again. But then during the Civil War, there's pits everywhere. The Serbians having the other people, yeah. like basically it was concentration camps, right? They basically mean like, it's going to happen again. Yeah. You know, you, you, being from, you know, studying Vietnam and having, you know, a history understanding of that, you know, think about what, so if you know, like the Weinberger doctrine and, you know, the coin, the counterinsurgency, yeah. Wh- yeah. which we developed after Vietnam yeah. to avoid a quagmire, I wonder, well, it happened again in Iraq. Yeah. Okay. It happened again in Crimea. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's happening again now in, you know, in Israel and and, and Gaza and Palestine. Yeah. And it's, we're not fault like, you don't eliminate counterinsurgents. Like, you know, it's, it, it is a embedded tactic yeah. where you are working. What's the thing right? for every, you know, whatever you, terrorist you call, whatever, everyone mm-hmm. you kill, you create three or four, right? Yeah. 
because uh, it's an because, ideology because you if you kill someone's mom or dad my dad wasn't terrorist that was yeah. my dad right yeah and you have Amy for life right yeah i mean just like when the hamas came and you know slaughtered all these people the music festival right <laughs> those people aren't thinking like you know these yeah. people from gaza kill my parents right no and it's never in the cycle you know so these i think and language of course, of course no one's thinking you know like like you talk about Israel, you actually do like like build hostel, be kindness, mm -hmm. but you know, of course they're not gonna do that, right? But if they were smart, they would like build hostels, no, there were no refugee camps, you know, help the Gaza people out instead of bomb them, right? Because but totally but the, but the revenge things are right. You know, how can you if you're the, the, the leader of Israel, how can you say, Oh, I'm gonna build a hospital in Gaza? People are like, Are you kidding me, dude? Like these people slaughtered us, like yeah. It's the, I mean, again, this is why it's so important to, you know, know history, right? Because right now we have access to it you know but we i think the kind of degradation of critical thinking in schools you know in educational spaces libraries public spaces you know dialogue that has degraded to yelling about you know um porn stars and you know like you know, yeah, it's, so it's, insane. it's it, it the, that dialogue isn't conducive to high intellectual that I'm always right, no matter what, right? Even if you prove to me I'm wrong, I'm right. No yeah. What, right? Um, and so I think, you know, when people know their history, they recognize like, oh, this is this happened before. We've heard this before, you know, like they promised this before. Um, and I just think we've got to be better, you know, and challenge. We have to challenge things more yeah. another time things face too like you no know, back in world war one had nothing about trench warfare right that never happened again but now ukraine russia is nothing about trench warfare yeah. with the additional drones which of course yeah. makes it worse right totally like you know in russia ukraine whoever goes offensive they lose a lot of people it's a defensive battle in perimeter we call it right and it's like and the people you know let's be honest when we think of underserved you know like a lot of the 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 young men that are dying in in the war are coming from russia's most you know, marginalized communities, yeah. right? They're, you know, Siberia, Magnolia, uh, Mongolia, um, you know, and places where they're poor and they don't have, it's really not yeah. a choice. No, right? I, I, yeah, I, I, Elon Musk was on a podcast a week ago and he said a good, right? He said like, Russia and Ukraine both have young men kill, killing each other who don't know each other mm -hmm. on the part of old men from both countries who do know each other, right? Yeah. And like, you know, like you said, they're coming from poor areas, you know, you know, they'll probably, probably, you know, I'll make this up, but both countries, you know, either go serve war or we're going to punish you, or if you go to war, you know, your family taking care of you, you know, like, what are you doing, you know? It's a hard choice. I mean, these are the, you know, this is, this is why I think it's so important for us to really think about how do we fix some of these challenges that we are addressing, right? I mean, are there technology solutions? You know, are there different social construction, you know, that we have to think about to achieve a more sustainable peace. And then it's not like this only just going on Ukraine, Russia or, or Gaza, like it's over the world, right? It's like, all over. You know, like in China, they have the Muslims in camps, supposedly, you know. Yeah. Um, the Uyghurs. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I think when the stand countries, like they pretty much like exterminating like one of the minorities, you're mm -hmm. right. Um, Stuff, every country does stuff going on right that's yeah. not, not good right it's and, sometimes really challenging to like you know as somebody who is an empath and feels things you know pretty deeply it i am often struck at how there's so much pain yeah right now in, in, in something from america like i'll make this up it's kind of like you know like pose like a couple's married have two or three kids and the husband says i'm gonna leave you you know, and then she's a single parent with three kids, no job, you know, like, man, and like, might be homeless if she just does something. Probably. Right. You know, you there's know. so many stories of suffering all over the world, right? There's, I mean, I think we have a solution, you know, I mean, we have the resources, you know, to, there's a lot of money in the world that yeah. lies with very few people. Um, and what's the point of having it if everybody's you know i mean i guess that's how i see it but i guess other there's plenty of other people who want to keep them you know um in you know servitude yeah right um but i think it's it 
ultimately that's what's keeping us back from a, a truly a a more interconnected you know um understanding world is is you know kind of the those very few people that are keeping us apart yeah so let's talk about diversity on that kind of stuff yeah fast. so so this is my opinion. I think a lot of people have the wrong team of diversity, right? I think too many people just say skin color, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's more Hispanic. Like, so example, a while ago, there was a, a company in, in Canada, right? They already got voted most diverse something, right? And they got clapped back at because everyone was white. Right? You know, they, but yeah. they, the people on the, one of them said, hey, we're all white too, but like one of us is like, you know, on the, on the scale, two of us immigrants, two of us are LGBTQ. So they were diverse in different ways, right? Yeah. Another example I used, there was a picture of these three black guys. They all graduated from Howard University and became doctors, right? And the capture was, what a great example of, of diversity, right? And people are like, like, they're all the same skin color. How can they be diverse, right? So yeah. can you talk about how like diverse is really not really like, to me, it can't be one definition, right? It There's not. It has to be over ever changing thing, right? There's no one definition of diversity. Um, you know, I think that's interesting. You know, I recently I've come, there's been a couple examples, I think, in our, you know, in the news recently about another white, you know, man, scientist getting an award, um, you know, and I think, well, is that really necessarily a bad thing? But then I, you know, then when I, for example, when I went back and looked at this, you know, how many they've, they've had four awards in the past, and all four of them have gone to white male. So I think, you know, at, if we're thinking about gender diversity, we would hope that ideally two out of four of them would be female. So that's just at the surface. You know, if we're looking for equity, we would say, you know, then we would try to find both, right? If we're thinking about, okay, well, you know, maybe they're, you know, male, female, now we're thinking, you know, what are these other categories? Again, this is why I don't really like thinking about category. It's like it forces us to categorize our ourselves into these checkboxes, which is exactly like how I'm trying to de, like, I, I want to avoid the categorization, but I'll go here because I think one way that we've solved it, at least I think we've solved it. The, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar if you're listening to the Fearless Fund, right? The Fearless Fund is being sued right now because they give, you know, grants to app specifically to African American women. And the reason why they're being sued is because they receive federal funding. And as a part of the law, a reason why, honestly, the um, you know, affirmative action won in the cases that it did, because the systems that they use to classify people or identify people based on race and then assign a, you know, a category, you know, category to those races on a scale, that is a racist policy, right? So, you know, I have to agree and understand that why they won because universities, you know, we hadn't progressed to thinking about how other elements of diversity really you know, can be represented in somebody's identity. So for 360 and our, you know, our venture fund, emerging venture fund called Enough Ventures, we chose to go with, um, we serve, or we invest in uh, individuals who have been traditionally underserved by venture capital, completely avoiding the race thing. Yeah, I think the first fund messed up, right? Because like, there's yeah. been a case in like a farm law, like one famous court case was like, and there's a school district in New Jersey that had to hire like somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And the most qualified person was a white person, right? But for the diversity, he had to hire the black person, right? So I hired a black female, white person sued because they only looked at the black person, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we're fullest from this time. I'll probably, probably get blasted with this, like where they said only black females, right? They were saying like no preferred or, you know, underrepresented, they've been good, right? Because they said, you know, only black yeah. females. And of course, no. Totally. I think it's wrong. I mean, honestly, I, I, I think it's wrong because they accept federal funded. Yeah. It's not, I, I would love for them to have a private, you know, to have avoided this altogether by 
maybe being a little bit more knowledgeable about accepting federal funding. Yeah. Um, or even not saying this is ethical or more, but maybe saying to yourself in, in their internal means, hey, we're only going to give money to black females. However, publicly, we have to say these are the warriors, right? I mean, I, I, I would, I want to be as transparent on the front as I am, you know, I think pe teams that work with me know that I'm the same person, whether, you know, I'm here or there. So I would say, you know, we really went hard into the reason why we chose traditionally underserved by venture capital, because I don't, you know, and I gave I mean, a whole. That could mean anything. Yeah. That could be like someone like me who's a military veteran. You are. 50, you know? Yeah. It's opened up to so many more. It's basically just not the people who are not underserved or, you know, the people who are served by venture capital are white Stanford men. Grad, Stanford grads. Yeah. White, educated, you know, yeah. um, well-networked men. 98 point, you know. Probably 98%. Yeah. And just think like just quarter three, only 0.17% of venture capital went to African American founders. Yeah. And the stats never get better. So, like, do I really need to, you know, like, would I say underserved? Yeah. It's basically everybody that isn't getting the money yeah. now. And back to the female fund, I think it would have made it worse for a lot of people. In fact, the person who sued him was the same person who got uh, a firm accident over Yeah, that was right. really unfortunate. So, that's, that's not a, to me, that wasn't a good look, right? It wasn't. And, you know, I mean, let's be honest. The Harvard system, the North Carolina system, they equated somebody's race to a numeric score. Yeah. That's a racist policy, right? So like, the, I, it's unfortunate because had universities, had systems really thought about how do we reflect diversity without grading somebody, you know, we could have really kept a really important institution intact. Um, and it's, you know, I, they're right. Those policies, you know, doesn't matter how you, you say it, you're classifying somebody and putting them, you know, scoring them based on those classifications. That's inherently. Yeah. With me, this is probably too simplistic, but I'm a firm believer. You get any group of people in a room and find a way for the diverse and not different. Like me and you, for example, right? You're like, yeah. we're both from Texas. We're both guys. However, comma, I'm straight. You're not. I'm white. You're a person of color, right? Yeah. I think. I think you get to any 10 random people off the street and put in a room and you'll find ways they're the same on something and with a different totally. Something, right? That's what we should be doing. I mean, that's, that is the vision, you know, like, which is why 360 doesn't specifically focus on uh, a specific category. You know, I met with a VC the other day who specifically focuses on LGBTQ plus, but what I found was I want a community that's reflective of the community that we live in yeah. and the world. We don't live in a bubble. You know, I don't live in a BIPOC bubble. You know, I. But, you know, some people do live like that, you know, like. Yeah. Basically, Seattle is a liberal leftist bubble, you know, conservative states, like a conservative right wing bubble, you know, there's so many bubbles around us. There's a lot of bubble and people feel safe in their bubbles. But I recognize as a leader. But you don't grow. Yeah, the exactly. That we have to challenge people, you know, and not all relationships, even within my incubator between teams are great. <laughs> you know, they so just people are people, right? Yeah. They're, you know, they're competitive and unnecessarily, <laughs> you know, because like, you know, that that leads to some animosity. Um, but I understand why those behaviors are presenting and it comes from their experience as underrepresented founders, why they feel like they have to not tell anybody what their company's name is, not, you know, make, ask people to sign NDAs to do discovery <laughs> meetings, you know, but it's because they're afraid, you know, something's happened to that founder before that's made them yeah. think they need that. So, well, and of course I'm not, you can't probably can't solve this problem. Right. But like, I got involved in tech probably 2014, 2015 after mm -hmm. the military, right? And back then, DI was a big thing, right? You always hear about it all the time. But based on stats, that's got better, right? But like, I mean, yes, a lot of objectively it has. A lot of performance stuff has got there, right? So, like, and it seemed like a lot of like these DI people, they switch jobs and pay six for incomes, but are they really doing anything, right? Like, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, like, every, like, I mean, bad example, like, I'm kind of mixed up, but I'm not. This one DI person was like a like a, a Apple, right? 
nothing reimproved, and they got, and that more money go to Google, right? But based on stats, nothing got better. Apple, yeah, they got a better paying job, right? Yeah. Like it just seems like there's a lot of performance stuff out there, right? Oh, it's it's a hundred percent. Um, you know what I think is really interesting is like we had we saw after George Floyd, you know, all these murders, you know, and the movement, you know, really partly where the name enough ventures came from. It's like, we've just had enough of this. Um, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to Amika Lozi here who came up, you know, who's one of our partners and really came up with that. Um, and I resonate with that because I think, you know, it is like, we've, we've spent this time trying to build communities that respect each other right like in my work we we spend a lot of time talking about bias and microaggressions and you know like how do we have respectful and it just feels it's I, like it drains me to have those conversations because i'm like we really should be past that i think what we're seeing now is that for example i right before i started my job at the cross-cultural healthcare program as a director of equity and inclusion i got an Comp competing offer at Amazon for a principal DEI business partner. Um, triple the salary, <laughs> um, you know, great. Uh, by, by any means, the offer looked great. When I was doing my loop interviews, the hiring manager told me, I just want to let you know that this is a, that this is a very brash culture in this particular line. And that you'd be certain you'd be supporting two white VPs who may not at all times treat you like you are the authority in the room. Um, and so just be prepared that, you know, it's not going to be an easy environment to work in. That, that's good. They told you that front, though. But I'm glad. A lot of people would not have said that. I'm I'm glad because. I, I did not accept the offer. Um, and I realized that's the culture in most corporate organizations, really, you know, most people don't want to spend their days at work talking about DEI, you know, they want to be there to work. Um, but we have to, because we haven't, I mean, I think of my work as we are doing inclusion. And, you know, like accessibility. It's not about diversity or equity. Because like I work with a lot of teams that are all white. Okay. But it's about understanding how individual values, experiences, orientations to life um, that inform their experience at work or in that community. Um, and finding ways to make that experience better. It doesn't mean adding more, you know, it's like not going onto the street going like, where's the brown people, right? But we're building a sense of community. And that takes whether you're, we're all white, whether we're all gay, whether, you know, whatever it is, whatever group we may be, identify with, we can still have authentic, deep, meaningful conversations with people about differences and commonalities and about how we can move the work together without divulging into, you know, like you didn't use the right pronoun or, you know, I just like give people the grace and, you know, understand that we're all trying. And there's a lot of things that we have to, you know, especially somebody with ADHD, I'm always kind of monitoring and, you know, code switching and filtering, but it, you know, it's hard for me, but I can only imagine for people who, you know, for young people now, like, boy, there's so many labels and so many you can do this and you can't yeah. do this. And, you know, like, what's it, you know, what's it mean to be, you know, a, a boy? What's it mean to be non-binary? What's it mean to, you know, ha have missed two years of school? And, you know, like, there are all these things that, I mean, I talked to five of my students over the last two weeks. They individually scheduled time with me to meet the other ones didn't know. Um, and we're like, what do I do? Like, what is there to do? Um, and so I think so, so many questions in people's minds about who am I? 
like, who should I be? Who do I need to be to be, to get the opportunities, you know? Um, and that's why I hate this classification thing so much. You know, I just read a student's graduate PhD application, his diversity statement yesterday. And it read like an academic, you know, like, like his whole life was only, it's the only thing that mattered, you know, and that's, that makes me sad, you know, because I think that's what our society is losing when we don't value the other aspects of people's identities, when we don't value spirituality, when we don't value traditions, you know, family experiences, when we don't value language and culture, you know, we lose those. Um, and I hope that, you know, conversations like this, conversations that we have with others in our work and, and the commitments that we make together, that we can make some progress, at least for our community, towards towards that. You talk about this, like, and of course, probably get a blast of this again, but like, I think too many people say diversity for difference case. But actually, there's a business case for diversity, right? Huge. Can you talk about this business case? I think a lot of people miss opportunity. Like yeah. Yeah. So um, McKenzie and Company has a great um, case study that they've been updating, I think, since 2016 or 2017, um, called the Business Case for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. Um, we see uh, for companies that have diverse um, gender teams, uh, we see a 26% increase in financial performance compared to those teams who have less gender diversity. When we look at teams that have more um, racial and ethnic diversity, we see a 37% increase in the amount of revenues um, compared to those um, who have less diverse teams. And these stats, where do these stats come from? McKenzie and companies. Okay, McKenzie that's, that's, their, that's their study. I okay. use It's like one of my primary references in okay. a lot of my presentations. So okay. know the data pretty well on that. Um, but those are, you know, there clearly is a business case. And I think I work with a lot of organizations going through organizational change management where, like, they have experienced a lot of turnover because of their culture. Um, and they wonder, like, what's wrong? Like, why, why did half of our team leave this year? You know, are we, and it's like, well, because you're not really addressing, you know, you're not thinking about um, the business case and in, investing in some of that. Like, you know, team taking a day off with a team to get them to, you know, I wrote my thesis at Johns Hopkins on retention, best practices in managing human capital in low wage service industry environments. Found that 55 cents was about, at the time when I wrote it, was about the amount that people would leave, would switch a job for. However, that was mitigated up to about $1.25 if there was one other person on that team that they felt were their friend. So, you know, it it's really important that we have that we allow for opportunities for teams to have those experience, shared positive experiences. And that's really how you build a culture. I mean, I think, you know, um, my partner, Madhu Verma, told me about um, a company that he used to work for called Isertus. Um, and they, they use the values Forte, F-O-R-T-E. And they start their meetings with the values, and I'd have to pull them up, but, you know, um, they start the meeting with their values. You know, it's a very values-oriented culture. And, you know, I think the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, how about you hear all the time, like, you know, a company with all, like, what's it, all white guys, right? They hire a minority. And a week after hire, that minority is on, on the interview committee, right? Yeah. Just like you have, like, you know, a non-white person interview committee. Like, they're like, I didn't take this job to be interviewing people, right? I want to learn my job, right? I mean, I think a lot of... Uh, when you don't know how to solve a problem, you know, I can understand a bunch of, like, white guys going, hmm, like, we have to find somebody of color. 
but having no skills or tools or awareness of how to do that in a way that doesn't tokenize that person. Yeah. It's like you're not hiring this person because they are a certain color or a certain or you know orientation. You're hiring, you're going out and you're saying we're going to look at a diverse group of people that identify with this yeah. and then we're going to find the best one. And that person is just as good or better than we are, but they identify, you know, their identity is the minority. Yeah. Right. I wish more companies thought of it like that because I, I have to caution, you know, some, some companies that are, you know, some individuals we work with of doing that type of hiring saying like, Oh, we need to find a X person. Fill in the blank demographic. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm sure in HR, you know, Jason, you have to think about like, what are things you can and can't say to, you know, like. You, you can think what do you want in your mind, but please don't say it out loud. Yeah. You can't ask, a, you know, you can't specifically like ask, uh, you know, a interviewee or an applicant if they're gay, you know, or if they have a disability. Or something even more simple. Like you can ask, you really can't ask somebody you have a car ticket to work, right? Yeah, yeah or yeah. if you're married. Yeah, you have right? to ask, you have reliable transportation to get this job, is remote, right? Because you ask them to have a job, I'm in a car, and they don't, then you potentially just create, I guess, you know, economic exactly. advantage people, right? It's, yeah. So you've got, you know, there's, again, I think this just makes people nervous. You know, like, there's plenty of examples of bad things happening when, um, when they don't do it properly, you know? Uh, or when they don't do it comp, you know, competently. Um, and so I think that's, that's like, it scares me, you know, thinking how, how are my clients handling these situations when they don't have counsel? Yeah. It's amazing what people do. Like I had a friend, this baby a couple years ago, she was a female software developer and she um, left, she left her job and, you know, she was married, she got pregnant, right? And so she did the phone interview, passed it, did a Zoom interview, passed it. When a person, they're like, oh, you're pregnant. We can't hire you because obviously your, your phone could be on your kid, not the company, right? You know? I mean, like, yeah, you can't. Are you kidding me, right? I, I try to convince them to go soon, whatever. She said, yeah. oh, I'll just, I want to mess with you. I'll just get another job, right? Have you, you know, it's interesting because, like, um, I think this happens to founders a lot, especially female founders. Like, how many times do you think a female founder has been asked if she has kids? You know, how many kids? Yeah. What's your plan to have your future kids, you know? Yeah. Um, or what, what, does, what does your husband do? Or, you know? Totally. Like, is this your side gig? Yeah. <laughs> what happens to your kids in school when they get yeah. sick, you know? You know, and so I think we get these types of, of questions, one where, you know, either race, gender, sexuality, you know, we have to navigate these. And I... One of the things that I'm really, you know, focused on doing at 360 is building a curriculum for our investors and our mentors and advisors around how we expect our team to interact with the community, right? Um, and it is around things like, you you know, these are things you can't ask. These are things, you know, the, we want to focus on promotion versus prevention style questions. You know, we want to, you know, we want our found or our investors to commit to certain, you know, like pre and post prep to, you know, because we have to think about how, um, how do we take bias? How do we take, um, you know, I mean, basically like prejudice, you know, and, and things out of every process that we have built for the people we serve. I think it's hard, right? Like bias, like this is kind of a joke I have, like, you know, so my bias is I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan, right? Mm -hmm. So every year you, right? And I see a fill out an Eagle fan, watch the Redskin or John, like, I'm not going to hire you. Yeah. Are you kidding, right? Of course I'm joking around, I hire the best person, but you know. But like, are you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, right? right? Yeah, you're not right. No, like everyone has bias, you know, oh, you know, a lot of people hire someone with tattoos or some mm -hmm. bun, like everyone has these biases, right? Totally. And I think if you if you accept that, you can move on and become a better person. I that's what I teach. You know, I do an activity um, at uh, during a lot of my trainings where I just try and normalize bias. 
You know, I say bias isn't good or bad in, inherently. Bias can lead us to good or bad behavior, but bias in and of itself, it just is. We all have biases. You know, like I have a bias towards bluebell ice cream. And oh my God. <laughs> that, oh. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to Texas December 14th. Oh, it's on my bucket list. Like, well, they have they have Dr Pepper one now. Oh shit! I know. Are you a, serious? A flight attendant on my way to Australia, she brought me. Oh, she was like, "You're from Texas." She's like, "Um, when you're there, they just released Blue Bell, um, ice cream that's um, that's Dr Pepper flavored." Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. And Dr. and then Blue Bell flavored Dr Pepper. Oh, vanilla, the vanilla, home, okay. homemade vanilla. Okay, I'm glad you told me that. So if you're a if you're a fan, hit up hit up hit up the Krogers. Okay, um, they should have uh, the Blue Bell okay. and the Dr Pepper. Looking forward to it. I can't wait. Where are you going to be? In the Dallas area. Okay, I'm going to visit my daughter. I got some investor meetings set up. You know, cool. And plus, my developer lives there, so I'm going to work with her. You know, nice. Yeah. Well, you know, I I'm a huge fan of um of um big company barbecue. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're up in it's a Houston, okay. Houston thing, but um, you can ship it. We get brisket every year for Christmas. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Man, so Bluebell just totally took over the conversation. I know. I love <laughs> Bluebell. By the way, I mean, when you're from Texas, if you aren't a fan, then you're really yeah. not from Texas. No. Bluebell ice cream, the barbecue, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, now, what were we talking about? Um, well, no, I mean, I think we were talking oh, the about business case yeah, the, yeah, the business case and how oh, okay. we've been, yeah. we've been thinking about how do we train people to have better, with the biases, yeah, yeah, the better biases. conversations. And, you know, I've even thought about like doing blind, you know, like investor pitches, you know, where they, it's like we, they record, you know, something ahead of time or, or are like voice modulated so that it's really like a blind process. Yeah. But I wonder how much effort, you know, if it would be more effort than yeah. it's worth. I mean, just like on, on LinkedIn, all these recruiters, you know, don't have a LinkedIn picture, don't have, because, you know, if they don't like you, you, you know, they're, but my thing is like, sooner or later, they're going to see who you are, right? And the next time, like, if somebody's racist, like, I don't like, you no know, Hispanic female, doesn't matter if they find out the first day or yeah. it's a process. Yeah. If they're racist, going to fire you. So we're not, get out of the way and, you know, not even go through the whole process, right? I think, you know, it's just, for me, it's, I, those aren't necessarily even things I think about, you know, like when I'm hiring, when I'm building a team, of course, as I've been building my team, I have been thinking more intentionally about it by, you know, it's not that brilliant BIPOC, but brilliant LGBTQ, you know, leaders don't exist. Maybe it's just, I'm not in the networks where I need to find them, yeah. you know? So it's, it's really, I'm learning every day, Jason, like I don't get it right all the time. Um, I don't know, you know, I even feel bad sometimes I don't, you know, necessarily uh, have made as much of an investment myself to, you know, like maybe some people would say that I should take more time to, you know, use people's non, you know, it's like pronouns, but like ones that, you know, Z or Z, like, that's the challenge, and I'd rather just use their name. Yeah. But like you said, why? You know, you get then. Well, why are you calling them their name every time and not their? So we try, and I'm, you know, we're doing our best. But I also don't think it's a fair expectation to expect that everybody else yeah. do what you want. You know, and it's just not realistic. Like, you can ask, and people can either follow or not follow. And there's intent, you know, there's a different, you can feel the intention. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So back to reverse hiring, like, I'm a big believer in reverse hiring, right? I think it's just good all in all. But I do think some companies take it to extreme, right? And so, like, this is a news reason, right? I get your opinion on this, right? So, you know, the airlines, they, they admitted that they're hiring the new pilots based only on diversity, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I don't know if I want my pilot to be based on diverse hiring, right? I want to be best on best pilot, right? Like, and maybe it's, I it came, it, I read it wrong, but the way I read it was like, okay, we're hiring only on, on diversity, right? But okay, is it, I don't know if I, you know, if we're airline pilot is based on diversity. I'm sure they meet the minimum qualifications, but if there's a better person who's not diverse, it, you know, based on safety, you want that person? What do you think? I think, first of all, 
it's always you know you should be looking for the most you know the most qualified candidate i'm going to take your argument and evolve it a little bit because i hear this a lot this is the argument against diversity hiring okay um and really it comes down to one are you looking have you made an effort to widen the hiring pool like did you just send this to some you know some of your contacts and say share this with your you know bipoc friends or like share this with your diverse candidates or did you really create a strategy around making relationships with establishing trust with you know and building pathways from those communities so i think that it's easy for somebody to say oh yeah well diversity hiring is you know is really just focused on finding the best of the worst I look at it as if you're really committed to finding the best every time, then your team would be already diverse, right? Um, and so it's really more of thinking about, okay, are we, do we have a diverse pool of candidates? Now, this then begs to differ, well, of course, you're not going to have a diverse pool of, let's say, Black engineers if there's only a thousand of them in the market and 20,000, you know, majority, you know, um, or white engineers, which we see, I mean, we have plenty of examples of thousands of tech companies that have only just started to diversify. So, you know, it, that was a talent thing. That was there. We didn't have programs that provided access to, underrepresented folks to become qualified to compete for those roles. That was a mar that was an intentional marginalization of non-white people in science and engineering, technology, math, that led to the underrepresentation of where we are now, right? So it takes time to build capacity. I think there's going to get to a point where it's no longer going to be realistic or re like accurate to say that we didn't have a diverse enough hiring pool. Like then you should go out and find them because 60% of the U S is now a person of color. Right. So you, you should be able to make that work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, you have to, you know, was looking for. Of course, obviously they have to be qualified, you know. Of course. But I mean, I'm not, not I'm, saying I'm, lower. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure the FA isn't going to say, hey, you know, low, lower the standards no. of Caucasians. But the way the article came off, it was just a go, we hired them only on diversity, right? Yeah. I, I think I'm not, I'm not for that on its yeah, face yeah. value either. Yeah. I think I, then that diminishes the individuals that were hired, yeah. right? Because they're saying basically the only reason you were hired was because you're diverse. Yeah not because you're the best candidate. And I, I, again, just challenge the premise that you, that even the people that are there are qualified. So next, moving on, kind of the same thing, but yeah. you're a certified equity inclusion trainer. Mm -hmm. Is that like, how do you become one? Like, is that test you got to take, qualification, or can I say, I'm Jason Kavanagh, I'm an equity inclusion trainer now. You have to do some kind of training, so to speak. I mean, I'm certified and I've been trained in, in several different equity inclusion certifications. I've taken one from, um, from, um, Northeastern, uh, I've taken one from Johns Hopkins. Um, and then I also did a 40 hour equity inclusion certification program when I started working at CCHCP, the cross-cultural healthcare program. And now I teach that, um, I've taught it probably nine or 10 times over the last couple of years. Um, and organizations, you know, they sign up, they send usually their educational and development trainers or health equity coordinators, doc, some, you know, um, doctors come and it's a 40 hour course. We do 12 different modules, um, navigating bias, equity inclusion defined, a culture of Western medicine, creating culturally competent systems of care, things like that. And then they teach it back. So then they, then for the 
they, they teach about two or three modules back to me. They get evaluated, then they're licensed for two years. Um, and so, you know, I'm about to head down to the University of Texas in San Antonio uh, to train um, their health equity department um, in, you know, in the beginning of 2024. So this is really a formal certification program that I now also teach and have developed some curriculum for it as well. And have you changed the curriculum since you started it? Yeah. So we did a big curriculum review last. It's uh, The company I work for has been around for 30 years. They had their 30th anniversary. But I think the training of trainers program, formerly like the training institute, the trainers, cultural competency trainers institute, um, was maybe 12, 15 years old, 20 years old. And we did a big major update of the curriculum last year um, and are, you know, regularly make updates to our content. Okay. So let's fix some mental health because you're a big mental yeah. health supporter. Yeah, love mental health. So, I mean, mental health is a big challenge, right? And I might be making this up, but like back in the day, we had all these mental health issues, right? Where like people were like get the electric shock therapy, people get treated humane, and then like they got rid of them. But now it's like all the mental health people are like homeless in the streets, right? Do we need to go back to where like, we're, I hate to use the word institutionalizing them, but where we like have them in buildings and like give them therapy and make them do it? I mean, mm. you... you know, this is really hard. Honestly, um, you know, I, I wonder, and maybe I take a harder position on this because I've experienced this system myself. I was a CASA for five years, a court appointed special advocate. So in, in King County, they represent children, or in Washington State, they represent children under the age of 12 in the child dependency system. Um, and after that, um, during college, uh, one of my best friends passed away after a four, you know, lifelong struggle, but after kind of a four year relapse with heroin. And so, you know, I've experienced this, this back and forth between, you know, being incarcerated, being on the street, being in transitional housing, living with me, um, and seeing a system that has completely failed hundreds of, you know, thousands of individuals. My best friend, Damien Jones, um, Navarone Jones, um, you know, had been in, in and out of, of different types of programs, mental health, um, drug addiction, um, for years. And he was, he had, you know, used to steal under $50 petty thefts. And three years before he, he, he died, they ordered him to complete mandatory court ordered inpatient treatment. Yet whenever they transferred him to the jail, they could never keep him or they did never, they should have, but this, nobody from treatment would come to the jail to pick him up. Right. And so in the transition, it, he was never able to engage in this mandatory inpatient. They, nobody gave him the resources to get there. And the one time I was able to do it before he passed, I picked him up from jail. I drove him straight to inpatient. He smoked a pill with somebody while he was having a cigarette before he went in and he peed dirty. And the system, and it started again. Because it's like, dude, you had to go to detox before you went into treatment. So I feel like our mental health system is really broken. And for me to say it would be easy to, yeah, in a perfect world, people that could benefit, you know, qualify, benefit, stay engaged would be forced to stay and engage in that system. But that takes money and that takes laws that allow us to And keep. it takes someone investing in someone. Yeah. And it also takes, it takes um, us being okay with taking away somebody else's power and autonomy for their, for what we are saying is for their own good. Yeah. So one time, my first time to San Francisco, right? A couple of years ago, I was on the BART train. Mm. And first time on the BART, 
and everyone told me the stories like what to expect, right? So I'm in the bar. And this guy, you know, obviously homeless, like he had a sleeping bag on, right? No shoes, no shirt, probably no pants, right? And you, you know, when you're a little kid, like you're playing the mud and the sun will bake the mud into you, right? Mm -hmm. He looked like it was skin to turn, right? And he was asking, up in the train, asking for a dollar. I'm telling myself, dude, well, a dollar does you no good, right? Like, dude, mm -hmm. someone needs to, like take a year out and invest you for a year, right? But like, but who has time to invest in someone they don't know for a year, right? It's not gonna happen, right? So this dude, like, ran, ran go on the train, asked for a dollar, right? No one gives him the dollar. Dollar does you no good, right? And most people don't have the time to invest in that. It's it's hard. I mean, people ask me, like, you know, I used to see him every day for like five months when he was in, or like three times a week, twice, two or three times a week when he was down at the county jail. Like, how do you have time for that? I went down in the mornings, you know? Um, but I still, you know, not everybody can save people. Yeah. You know, and I don't look at myself as a savior, right? I, I look at myself if in this moment, am I able to help somebody? Yeah. Like last night, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't usually tell this story or use or share these things. But um, last night I was on Capitol Hill and standing next to a um, hot dog stand, you know, and this guy was just saying, like, asking everybody that went by if they'd buy him a hot dog. And I was just like, I'm going to buy him a hot dog. Like, the, there's no line there, and it was raining, and he wasn't wearing his shoes like a either. a simple act of human kindness. Yeah, it was just like, it's, it wasn't hard, you know? Uh, and it shouldn't, like, I don't know why people in America or anywhere in the world, you know, anywhere in the world should be hungry, you know? So it was such an easy thing. You know, I didn't even have to get cash. I just tapped a card and walked away. Told him to give him, you know, it's his hot dog. Let me ask you this. What made you decide, yes, that person? So like this aside, you know, this suppose like that whole day, 15 other people ask you for money, dollars, whatever. Yeah. And you're like, to, if, I did actually, actually I did one time. I did experience one time. This one day, like 15 people asked me for a dollar, right? I said, if I gave one a dollar 15 times this, times that, like that's not doable, right? So how do you decide? what to give one person and, and deny other people, right? I mean, it's a tough decision, right? Or just like, that's the way his voice can probably hit your heart or something like that, or? You know, it's, it's a little bit difficult. I spent a lot of time blaming myself for my best friend's passing. Um, he had lived with us for about a year prior, my husband and I, Daniel and I, about maybe nine months prior, and he had stolen some medication from us. Um, and, you know, I get it, but like, I have to make decisions that keep my family safe and protect, you know, and, and he knew the rules and I had to ask him to leave. You know, not forever, but well, it turned out to be forever. But, you know, like two days later, he overdosed, you know, um, and I was like, you know, I wasn't able to save him. Not that I wanted, not that it was my responsibility, but like that, that moment has stayed with me. I see I see Damien's face on a lot of people like that. Um, and I also know what it feels like to be passed by. I grew up as an only child, you know? Um, and so it's hard growing up, you know, neurodivergent, you know, like an only child, you know, like there, there's, there were a lot of times when I felt people ignored me or passed by me, you know, and like wouldn't play with me or, you know, like had their own things going on. And nobody wants to be ignored, you know, like say, even saying no is better than just people pretending like you're not there. And I think the moment people for do me. All, people do all the time, they hear, can I have a dollar? And they pretend they have their earphones on. Yeah. Or hear them. And like the pivotal thing for me was he looked 
not just like distrust, but like completely helpless, you know? Um, the look on his face when he turned around, like when he just, he just turned away from the street, you know? And I was like, can I get you a hot dog? Because like, I could only imagine if I was in that state and all these people out there spending money on drinks, yeah, right, yeah, in you, right in front of you. Have a good time, paying for ten, fifteen dollar drinks. You know, yeah, like, probably I probably spent two hundred bucks last night. You know, and so like, yeah, my, I was out with friends, and so you know, but that's like seven, eight drinks. You know, I definitely um, think in Seattle, the problem is Seattle, like, well, just desensitize you, right? Yeah, like example of like, so I've been this, here in this building like maybe since March, right? And there's a guy, I'm right next to the post office. There's a guy in the post every day, right? So a few months ago, I asked someone to work in the building. Hey, what's the, guy, what's the deal with this guy in front of the post office? And according to him, this guy's been in front of the post office for like 12 years. Like, he said people try to help him. He always says no. Like, he's eight to four. You know, they think he has dementia. They try to help him. He always refuses it. So he's been, like, totally 12 years. He's there every day from eight to four. Goes somewhere, comes back, right? And, like, how do you help someone like that, right? Is it, you want to help him, you know, but then again, okay. You know, people try to help him. He said no. Like, you can't, like you said, you can't. Force them to do it right. I mean, this is this is why it's like what what I had to become really good at when I was a casa. You know, the standard for keeping children in the homes of families that are experiencing hardships is pretty low. And so I was always amazed at like when they say adequate housing. I'm like, boy, this house has dog shit everywhere and the dishes are out, but there's running water, you know, and the kid, the kids have a room. It's not clean, but they have a place to stay. And I found myself realizing that what we think, and this is actually a positive thing about the system. When you have such a need and you were required to have a, you know, a relatively low paid workforce with high turnover that is expected to meet the needs of thousands of people in need. You have to have a standard that is low enough that it doesn't overwhelm the system. Um, and so I do think that this challenge that we have could is in some, we can't ever mitigate all of it because that person, if, you know, maybe there is something that would work. You know, maybe the mental health issues that he's facing, you know, and I'm just assuming maybe there could be some mental health issues that that's preventing him from feeling safe ask receiving help. Right. Um, and so maybe this is not the best place. Maybe it's somewhere else, but also not taking away his right you know, to autonomy. Yeah, definitely. So obviously in Seattle, there's all these organizations, right? I won't name them. Like, you know, they money from Amazon, Boeing, Microsoft, they, you know, I'm sure that executive directors have paid a lot of money, right? Yeah. Are these organizations actually doing any good? I mean, I'm sure they are to an extent, you know, but it's like, and of course, homeless is a hard problem. All this stuff is hard, hard, but man, like, millions of dollars have been thrown this problem, right? It's like, oh, that's you're, a hard you're, one. You're looking outside, like, like, man, what's going on, right? Like, I sometimes think we throw too much money at stuff, right? Oh, yeah, totally. And not just throw too much money, but make the money too hard to get. Yeah, I think, too, a lot of people have this mentality, right? Well, I'm not going to go personally help this person out, but if I, throw, if I donate $20,000 to, like, like St. Mary's or Mary's Place or Real Change, I've done my part right. Not Some people I like to do that. I mean, I've, I've done that for things. You know, like, I can't invest in, Af you know, Africa, but I invest with Kiva and do micro lending in the region, you know, but, you know, like I, um, I think this is an interesting question about like, what is, you know, what do we mean by valuable here? Like what is there? And, and, and other two follow up, like, so like these nonprofits, homeless, what do you want to call them? So they have some kind of success metric, right? Yeah. And like, you don't mean success, the success metric, where it might be, you didn't get more, no more money, right? Yeah. Or, you know, you, You've been given like ten million dollars per year by, say, Amazon or whatever company, right? By the ten million, like, 
four point five is going to admin costs. Yeah, you know, totally. And you know what? This is this is really where people need to be more critical of, like the organizations that they're giving money to. You know, I think critically. You know, I love World Vision. Don't get me wrong. I, I, but they're you know, and Red Cross, but they're you know, Red Cross spent a hundred and fifty million dollars in Haiti and not built like one house or something. One house like that, yeah. was built. You yeah. know, um, and so I, I really wonder, you know, why people give money to these organizations when they know that they're not really doing the best with it. So, in Seattle, I would say I would compare that to like. King County Regional Homelessness Authority that was given a lot of money from the state, but and then they're responsible for distributing that money to other sub providers, which are now all competing with each other for that money. There's there's no real coordinated central strategy yeah. where we're saying, okay, we're going to have real change. We're going to have the, um, you know, the gospel homeless mission. We're going to have you know, one direct, you know, I don't know, all these different organizations really like basically staff an agency by taking people from those organizations and collaborating. Because there's, I mean, I'm in homelessness, I'm in mental health, there is so much competition for funding, for grants, for application, you know, and it's like, and even after that, the money's hard to get yeah. and it's hard to keep. And then too, like you're like, but we're, there's like so many, I'm just like veteran nonprofits, so many veteran nonprofits, right? Yeah. And these all these nonprofits out there, like, are you really trying to solve something, or you just want a job, or you just want a nonprofit to save you some money, right? Yeah. Nothing too, like you know, obviously you need to get paid money, right? You need, but you know, you're a nonprofit, you shouldn't be competing. You shouldn't be saying, hey, I'm an executive, executive director, I should get paid the same as executive director at Amazon, right? No, of course not. And I mean, that's, well, you know. I, I would say that as a whole, nonprofit employees are underpaid based on even their comparable roles in industry, but then minus 20%, yeah. you know? Um, and I don't think that that's how we should think. Like nonprofits, just like any business, should be sustainable yeah. businesses. I mean, it's a business, right? It the is. The only thing different is the tax code or whatever. My, right? You know, both the nonprofits, all three of my nonprofits, the one that I work for, CCHCP is a nonprofit, we were pro my my department and our whole organization was profitable this year. 360 was, you know, there was almost 30%, 34% um, net operating income that we made this year. Um, and then my uh, Circle of Friends for Mental Health, my other nonprofit, we, you know, through grants, we were profitable this year. Um, you know, so it's possible. Now I have had to bring on volunteers and other, you know, work studies and interns to help. But I'm finally gone to the point where I'm paying staff, right? And paying them above market, like our minimum hourly rate at 360 is 3250, all the way up to like 100 an hour. Yeah. Um, so even though they're not doing as much work, they are getting competitive measure rates yeah. with us just doing less yeah. work. And like, I know like me and Channel be kind of critical now, probably we do realize there's a lot of people doing great work for not profit. Totally. So a lot totally. of people doing great works, you know, but. I mean, we, and we see that, I think the thing is, you know, we, as you know, we have a platform and an opportunity now to, to call out when there are organizations that could be doing better. And I don't think it's just nonprofits. You know, I think there's a lot of nonprofits out there that are masquerading or for profits that are masquerading as nonprofits, you know, um, I think a lot of incubator and accelerator programs out there. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, like, let's be honest. There's a lot of that I've come across and I'm sure that you've come across where, you know, you're like, I wonder where their money's going, you know, yeah. um, you see them get, they publicize, you know, $10 million from this company, $10 million from this company. Yeah. But you don't see the money coming down to your level. And you're like, okay, what's, you yeah. know, like, what's going what on? Are we, what are we really doing? Yeah. Um, are you just fundraising to pay your own salaries at the national level or something? Totally. I mean, this is my question. Like, you know, for all the money that Techstars has, for all the money that Plug and Play and Y Combinator have, where's, why aren't they giving more money to their team? Yeah. 
and why are they taking so much equity? You know, I, and what's bad to say is like, you know, like tech stars are watching comment. I'll make this up, but I think they get like $125 investment, for like 7%, right? 6%, $125, but in reality, tech stars, they only give $25,000 in cash. The rest is a the re note, right? Yeah, which is like. But then there's other ones, like I think just think of Generator 8 out of yeah, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. They give you like 20000 for 10%, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. It's like. Or the Flywheel Conference. How much do they, what was that like for? 20% or yeah. something. I mean, that's not so like, that's like, you know, might as well go to a private lender. You might as well go to a partner, like the, what's, what's it called? The paycheck lending thing, yeah, right? And it would be better. Yeah. And get a right 25% thing, you know, or put it on a credit card. And then would... we're off subject, <laughs> but then like, what do you think of accelerators? It's like, I'll do the same thing, right? What about I think most do the same thing. Not if, you know, but we are, we don't like, and that's the difference. You know, I mean, I spent a lot of time I've taught for incubated, you know, I've taught for the National Science Foundation. I've worked at CoMotion, you know, I've been mentors for a huge number of other programs around, you know, um, so I, I've seen that incubators, accelerators trying to make their mark by the sector. Yeah. You know, we even in Washington or Seattle, we have Maritime Blue. Yeah. We have 360. You know, ours is focused on social impact. We have, you know, Bunker the Labs. The Bunker Labs. Yep. And then there was um, um, Intuitive X with, you know, Dr. Rowe, who was focusing on medical devices. And we have Pioneer Squirrel. You know, they all have their things. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, I think, you know, like um, as long as we're calling some people out here, you know, people or companies, you know, I think like, you know, Madrona Labs, Pioneer Square Labs, they're investing in generative AI and all these things that, let's be honest, I don't, it's a fad, you know, and they're pouring millions of dollars I mean, into- I mean, last year, the fad was Web3, NFT, yeah. you know, now- Next. You better not try to pitch that right now. Yeah, totally. That's all, yeah. I mean, the joke, I saw a joke on somewhere like, you know, it's so bad, like, you can have a food truck and say you're gonna implement AI and get a $10 million investment for your yeah. food truck because you're gonna have AI. Totally. I mean, it's, 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 it's hilarious. A, it's a food truck. Yeah. And my dad was asking me, like, why didn't you mention AI in your in, um, innovation cluster? Because I was like, I explained all the things that it does instead of saying AI, AI, AI. You know, and I think we really have to think about that. Yeah. Like, when we think about the value, are they really adding much value? I mean... Not that it, my opinion doesn't matter at all, but let's be honest, how many people really care about what they're saying? You know, if, if like all these programs were so great, then why wouldn't we see much, much, much higher levels of success? Yeah. That's why we chose a studio model. You can't really get to know a team over three months. You know, you can't really get to know a team over six months. How can you provide access, information, mentorship, if you don't have time to build a relationship, right? You will never get the contact that will introduce you to the investor until you've known that investor long enough for them to want to share that with you and know that you're the right person. So I always find it, you know, we don't have a time limit on ours. No. Um, and we, it's intentional because we grow with our teams, our teams at some point have leveraged some component of our studio and beginning quarter one, we will be fundraising for a venture fund that is squarely focused on supporting individuals that have supported our community that are in our community and reflect the values. But don't get me wrong, Jason, there will be a time and it is my mission my vision and ambition will get me there. There will be a time when I will have a bigger platform to address some of the systemic challenges that our community, that our ecosystem here in Seattle is continuing to stumble around. So we're going back to homelessness a, a, a later on, but for your studio, why did you decide to start it? Yeah. Um, so I was working at, I was teaching, um, um, the NSF I-Corps program at UW, um, 
And I just found that I was having a lot of underrepresented founders, females and BIPOC founders that was scheduling time with me. Like one week I had 12 different meetings with teams that wanted to meet with me. Um, and the other instructors were like, what, like, what are they all wanting them to talk to him about? You know? Um, and it was like, well, a lot, a number, and this is my issue, not just with i or any of the, you know, any of these other, even the Burke Center programs, you know, I can't, I could, I couldn't count on my hands how many times an investor from the Burke Center programs have made one of my founders cry. Right. So same thing was happening. You know, like I had a, I, you know, had an incident in one of the mentors or in one of the groups, feedback groups I was having in i where this guy kept like it was a doctor. I was working with a doctor. They introduced themselves with their title, their, you know, all, all of the things that they had the fellowships and, you know, um, and this guy refused to call her by her name and kept shortening it and not even using doctor. And it was like, you know, it was palpable in the group, but it also wasn't the first experience. Those incidents made me realize that there is no safe space, no community space for underrepresented found that were being served well in Washington state, in the region, I don't think. So we really set out on a mission to find out how we could be different. So at the beginning or at the end of last year, we did a mentor circle on BIPOC entrepreneurship. Um, and we spent a lot of time investigating, asking questions, interviewing, how, what community do we build? What's needed? And that's when 360 was born. Um, so really out of that need for like, I don't do any advertising and we already have over 30 teams, you know, and like, I have, I, we have to scale our capacity because like I had eight meetings with teams last week. Four of them are not members yet that want to work with us because of the community that they're hearing we're building. So this question might come out wrong, but what made you delusional enough to think you could pull this off? Yeah. You know, I, I'm driven. I'm ambitious. I have created the style of my life, you know, has always been, and I think this comes from maybe being an Eagle Scout or, you know, my grandfather, my parents, my grandmother, um, you know, that always said, like, if you're going to do something, you have to do it well, and you should stick with it until you can hand it off to somebody who can either continue or do it better. And I knew that going in with 360 that I was going to either have to commit to it or, you know, stick with it until somebody could take it. Um, and I feel like the, the biggest thing when, so Jillian Musig, she's the managing director at, at the master's fund. Yeah. I, yeah, no, she yeah. Okay. Um, we met almost a year ago today. Um, and we had our first or second meeting together in West Seattle when she challenged me to start a venture fund. Um, and she said like, you know, we, there has to be more people like you who are committed to doing the hard work so that your community can benefit. And after the next meeting, she was like, you know, I'll support you, but you have to raise a hundred million as your target. And I thought that's crazy. That's, that's crazy. She said, you'll do it. You're going to do it. So I've spent this year really thinking about what is, why we're doing that. And what I've come to realize is there are so many other opportunities available to other people, you know, that come from privilege that come like, like or, or you are here the time, raise a family and friends, right? Yeah. Oh, I think that's I a big, hate that. like, 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 
what if you are the family friends, right? Yeah. I always thought that's the biggest shit of crap ever. It is. And you know what? I've been in sitting in, in meetings or, you know, um, most people don't have some random, for example, for you know, I'll say this. Yeah. So I was a part of the win mentoring program. Right. And, um, and which is at life science, Washington. And one of the, you know, we were in a meeting, one of the, I wasn't the, I was just an advisor for one of the teams. So it wasn't necessarily me. And there are these, you know, pretty power, pretty well-known, you know, investors and advisors that are there to, to work with you through the Win Mentoring Program. And after struggling for months and months at, for fundraising and going to, you know, we went to commerce shows and we were traveling, you know, I got, we got the question, you know, have you thought about raising a small friends and family round of, oh, maybe 300,000? Like, get the fuck out of here. And that's what happened. He was, you know, he shut off his camera and he said, and he emailed, he's like, I'm, I don't, they made me feel stupid. Yeah. That's the feeling. So I use that example because it's like, you know, we have, as somebody who's experienced this, I don't want to sugarcoat things for people so that they think that, you know, we went out to solve a problem that wasn't important. Okay. I'm sharing things and experiences that have happened to me. Like I've been in that meeting. Okay. I was at Columbia tower a couple, you know, during the summer, I'm a member. Surprisingly, I guess people were surprised that I was there because some, several of the members of this group were like, Oh, are you here for the event? I'm like, no, I'm actually having dinner here. And they're like, Oh, we had no idea. You know, one person even, they were like, Oh, we're members of the Bellevue club, but this one's so much more prestigious. <laughs> and, um, I was like, okay, cool. And then they're like, come over and join us after, you know, join the group after you have, have dinner. And I went over, you know, after we finished and it was kind of, you know, we joked, my colleague and I was like, Oh, well, you know, got an invite to the white party because <laughs> um, we were both not. And um, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't really want to go. We'll go over and say thank you, you know, but we're going to head out. Because I said, you know, I've been asking to be a part of this group for the last year and a half. I actually asked their group for a letter of support a year and a half ago. And, um, and they said, no, we don't really know what, you know, don't know what you're, you know, what you're going to do yet. And so now, you know, then they invited me to, oh, we'd love to have you come speak to our group about the fund you've been building. I just said, no, thank you. And I told him, I said, you know, listen, I've been asking to join this group for a year and a half. But now that I'm here and you've seen me here and I'm doing my own fund, now you want me to come back and share. I'm going to pass, but thanks for your, you know, invitation. The way people treat me now just because they know I'm doing a certain thing completely changes the context of how I'm treated, you know, by, you know, I haven't given any money, but I have a venture fund, which just starting, but it doesn't matter. Cause what is that going to build to? What is that going to grow to? And so now people who before didn't think to pay attention are now, you know, yeah. first in line. So obviously it's not the same thing, but like, you know, I recently raised my first $25,000, right? Yeah, congratulations, and, by the way. Yeah. I donated. Yeah. Or I, I I was a part of so, so this is something different. Oh, it's not the crowdfunding. No, it's not crowdfunding. Okay. Something different. I actually got $25,000. Well, fund. then even better. Yeah. Congratulations. And so now I have people reach out to me who wouldn't give me the time of day before. Oh, I heard about your, your investment. You know, let's talk, right? I'm going to think to myself, do I want to be petty and say, fuck you, or, but, or like be a better person? I can say, right? You can say, fuck you if you want yeah. to, Jason, because like, Listen, I, I was clear about what I wanted to do. I'm sure as you about, you know, we learn, of yeah. course, not that we don't learn and our product doesn't get better, but I set out with a intention and a clear commitment to make this space better for our founders, for our community than it was before we started. And because we've been so committed to that, because our team has been so committed to that, there's been no doubt when we, you know, take action, who it's for, right? And I think that's the difference. You know, it's like you can, otherwise they're just values, right? We display the virtues of what we espouse at 360. 
Um, and I think it really is the difference. Like, you know, there is, it's easy to invite people to a space. It's a different thing to create an experience that people want to come back to. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think great congratulations for raising that money because it does just take one. And then you, you have now the ability to go back and say, well, who was just waiting who believed for the social, in me? For the social proof, yeah. Yeah, but just waiting for validation. We, we have a lead. What do you want to call it? Yeah, and who just wants to make money because somebody else and and now your valuation is going to be higher. Yeah, you know, and you have to ask yourself that. And I think that's why I stay away from big venture funds and big accelerator programs, incubator programs, because they're looking for the unicorn. Yeah, they're not looking for you, right? Yeah, like if you, you know, they're they're strategically saying where can we return the money when we invest um and so you do be and it's okay to say fuck you when people come back and make it so obvious yeah that like oh i was just waiting to check up you know follow up on you yeah. really because we I, scheduled I have, five meetings yeah you know? I have six unanswered emails or where the case yeah. be right you know yeah so stick to your values on that and i you know i was i tried this out recently where I was just straight up with an investor that I wasn't interested in, in their money. And they circled back around with, I'm not sure if you were intentional about this or, or if you meant to do this, but like the fact that you told me that you don't need my money yeah. makes me want it more. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but like not everybody fits that value system. You know, and again, we want to see values translated to virtues for the for the people that we work with, because that's really the evidence of that culture is the evidence by the work that we do. Yes. So for your, your studio, is it only for social companies doing social impact? So you have to align with one or more of the UN goals for sustainable development, but there's 17 of them. So, okay. Let me ask you this. This is another simplistic question, right? And I can I can think of a better example. So I'd go to work. Mm -hmm. Suppose there's two companies come to you, right? One will say is like pro gun, right? They think to make a social impact with pro gun. The other company says they're anti gun. Both think to make a social impact. And I'm I'm just assuming they line up on the UN goals, right? Mm -hmm. You let them both in. You decide which one gets in. How's that work? Well, every every turn every team deserves to be evaluated, you know. And I think it's. Just because a product is inherently pro gun, for example, doesn't mean that they can't be social impact. Think about it. Let's say, um, I'm trying to, you know, okay, let's say Japan, for example, okay, um, you know, in in a society that maybe doesn't have access to to guns, pro gun may be, you know, we're we are advocating or creating technology that democratizes the right to access in places where they should have access, but they don't. Now, in that situation, maybe you would view gun, you know, pro-gun as, as a social impact, because like they're expanding rights, human rights, versus, you know, anti-gun, where it's about taking away people's rights, right? So again, this is a nuanced issue. I just use that as an example, because it really is a case by case. I don't, you know, we've been, I've gotten questions about, hey, like, you know, Monday.com, our, our project management platform is owned by, a, is, is an Israeli company. And, you know, I've had a, found a couple teams that asked me, like, are we still going to use Monday? And I think, and I asked my dad while I was home, I was like, you know, I, I was thinking about it, not saying I was going to make a decision, but, you know, I realized that just because there may be some values that don't align, it's not necessarily my exclusively my job to determine. I have a team, you know, we have criteria. And if there was a consensus that that impact or the defined impact that they want to make doesn't align with our thesis and the way that we want to do business, then we would then yeah. 
I go to, even though the Israeli company, do you really know the least on Monday supports the Israeli government? You know, like you don't know that, right? You don't know. And maybe even maybe the CEO of Monday supports what's going on. Maybe the employees don't, right? Yeah. I mean, it's then there's ones on both sides. I've seen it, right? Like I've seen there's employees where they're US based, Israeli based, you know, they're uh, and the mix where, you know, they're hashtag, they're talking. I mean, it's that that's expected. You know, there's not one side of any. Major, I mean, and this especially is an issue that is highly divisive. Yeah. So what's what's your business model, 360? Yeah. So um, we, because we're a studio, we run one, we're a nonprofit. So we have a non, our nonprofit board, but we're really an earned revenue. Um, and so we do consult like discounted consulting um, and uh, fractional support services for teams. We also work for, you know, have a different contracts with the state of Washington, Department of Commerce, Pacific Northwest Economic Region, um, for as a solutions provider um, for different programs in the state. Then we have membership fees, um, which come from revenue positive teams in our incubator. Um, we have donations, which, you know, is probably about 7% of our total overall revenue. Um, and, um, and then of course we have traditional, you know, grants, um, and like longer term funding as well as angel investment funding from, from my family. So you said people have stayed there as long as they want, right? So let's suppose like those come there now, it's, it's going to be January 24, 24, right? I'm assuming you have some kind, of, some kind of means to track how people are going, right? Yeah. Well, and suppose you, it comes like November, 2024. And they've made no progress. As a matter of fact, they've gone backwards, right? Do you still let them in or do you say, hey, yeah. okay. I mean, let them, you know, there we have accelerator programs in our incubator. So, like let, I would say the um um, for example, the how to sell nothing program, which Joe Paolo, our one of our consultants, did for six months. That's a program that you were admitted into, right? Um or the, you know, the innocent entrepreneurship program that we have. And we're going to have a, um, a Colby, uh, what is it? Um, Innovate with Colby Founders Edition. Uh, Mike Lee, uh, formerly um, at Menlo Labs. Uh, and then before that at Home Depot, um, where he scaled, you know, four startups in the 20, uh, Fortune 25. He's doing a program with us this year for up to 10 teams on doing Colby assessments. Um, to really identify their superpowers. So, you know, there are some programs that we have which we admit teams to. However, anybody can be a member of 360 as long as their business aligns with one or more of the UN goals. Now, in the case of having a team that's been around for a year and not really doing anything, we would already know by month two or three, because we have monthly follow, you know, check-in meetings with teams, um, but you know, though between January and November, we would have hopefully have already connected teams with resources that either would have helped them get there or to make some type of pivot decision. Um, but you don't have, you can be a member without pay. You know, if it's more about the mission, are you aligned with the values, how we operate, how we do business, how we support each other. And then if you're, if you want services from us, you can pay the membership fee. And what's the application process? Um, we're finalizing an, our new application process right now. Um, you know, I had a lot of the teams that are in the, were in the incubator initially were clients of mine. Uh, and some still are a number of clients of mine. Um, but now, you know, we have a pretty standard application, um, you know, what what is your company you know financial history what if you know what's your what are you building what's your vision for the world team you know each kind of category operational category it's high level but then it's supplemented by interviews right um so my team will maybe my chief of staff will meet them then i will meet them um and then you know we have we will determine you know whether or not we want to support. Um, I I am I envision that with our cluster, 
we will probably expand membership beyond what we are doing with just like the one-on-one -on -one interactions with teams. Now, how many people are in the, on it right now? How many companies? So there's about 30 companies. I have 90, I have 94 people that are registered in my project management system. Um, and that was last updated in October. And we've, I would imagine that we're, well, we have th two more teams and a bunch more collaborators as a part of the cluster that, uh, like I said, nine more letters of commitment already. So, um, I'd say there's, it's, it's easily a hundred plus people. So what's the max number you can support realistically? We're scaling to support global operations. I mean, our venture fund will, you know, I've, I've, I'm taking a humble salary in order to promote and, you know, to fully staff, like ideally we'll have eight full-time staff, um, you know, when we're at full operational capacity. And you provide the final like an office space to work out of? Yep. Okay. And you say you you only do monthly check-ins? You do. You could be monthly. It could be quarterly. We want you know we don't want to be burdensome on team. So I was going to ask like, why monthly versus I know some people do it weekly, some daily. Like why why monthly? A lot of founders asked for more frequent interactions, so they were like, we want to meet monthly and check in on you know a lot could happen in a month. And the monthly check-ins are they in what, person? Or? Yeah. No, they're they're on Zoom. So my, you know, my team is online um, and we have a, we actually have a standard um, process that we go through. And with. So since meetings. in Zoom, you have like companies across the world taking yeah. part in this? Okay. I do. We have team, we have a team in Germany. We have a team in Brazil. Um, I have a team in Mexico, um, Italy. So with teams all the place, I'm presuming. Australia you, now. With teams everywhere, I'm assuming you, you run this off Seattle time. Yep. Well, I mean, you know, I was up at 5 a.m. on Wednesday talking to partners in Dubai. I was on at 9.30 last night talking to partners in India. So, like, it's really me that work. Like, our team works yeah. globally. I What, on Tuesday, our, you know, our, or thir what, Friday, our meeting, my colleagues, my venture partner, she's in the U.K. right now. So, like, we just have to make it work. Yeah. So let's suppose let's fast forward to December 2024, right? What has to happen during the year of 2024 before you say you met your success mix or this been a successful year? It's already been a, well, 2023 was a successful yeah. year. 2024 will be successful when we launch the venture fund um, and launch our second, like our post piloted version of all the programs that we developed last year. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing huge growth in our partnerships and collaborations. For example, the University of Washington, I startup lab, their startup I school, you know, we're going to be doing some branded workshops with them next year. We signed, um, an, you know, like a letter of commitment from CSIRO, which is uh, Australia's national science agency, um, you know, with life sciences, Queensland, um, with a number of organizations um, in, you know, that are really focused on building collaboration. Uh, Swinburne University uh, of Technology, uh, Monash University, you know, we're really looking at globally scaling the opportunity for underrepresented founders, innovators, entrepreneurs, whatever the path. I mean, my pathway was not, I'm in healthcare now, but my pathway to that was via political science and economics, right? So I think we have to look at human potential as boundless, right? And if we can stimulate access or catalyze or create or make it easier for people in that are connected to our community to innovate, that's success. And honestly, you know, I couldn't be more thankful to our lawyers at Focal Law, you know, Zoe Maddox and, and her entire team for really being, and, and also the Washington State Microenterprise Association and Lisa Smith's team for being our first investors, right? I think had it not been for Focal and had it not been for the WSMA, other like you just experienced with your investor had, you know, you not had one piece fall. Others may not have 
come and said, okay, like you're validated or, you know, you've done it. And so what to me success is being able to continue to demonstrate the value that we're providing to the community. Okay. We are, we're adding part, our partnerships reflect like the growth, the reach impact of our programs reflect that we have been successful in scaling that model. So you're talking about the sum, but go into more detail. Like suppose a, a company joins your studio in January, 2024. What values, what should they expect from you or from your studio during the time there? You know, I would say the most valuable thing that they can expect is a trusted relationship, you know, um, and mentorship. Um, what I heard recently from one of my, one of the teams that I work with is that people of color never get, or always have to pay for advice, never get, never get, never get any free advice. Um, and I think it's so true, you know, like it may, maybe we don't pay for it, but it comes with a cost, right? And I want to remove that burden for people of feeling like, they can't share everything they need to, to get the feedback that they want, or that they have to worry about if this person's going to steal their idea or, you know, who they're going to share it with. Founders told, we interviewed 400 hours of founders last year, our team did, for the development of our innocent entrepreneurship curriculum. Resoundingly, founders of color and other underrepresented founders told us that the most important thing that we could offer was that trusted mentorship and access to networks and communities. It wasn't even the money because they can get the money if they are in those networks, right? And if they have those relationships where people are, you know, buying for them, you know, if, imagine the power as an investor that, you know, the managing partner of, of Techstars or Pioneer Square Labs, if he makes one phone call after he meets with the team to one of his partners and says, I think they, not the right for us, but I believe they deserve an investment. Why can't we be doing that? You know, maybe they do, but I want to, I feel like we have a responsibility to build a platform around that. Because what I realize is some of the investors that really want to work with our teams don't even know that our teams exist. You know? Um, and the social impact money is, there's a lot of it. So how do you about this, right? How do you go about having this tough conversation with founders when they're doing stuff wrong or on the wrong path? We're still being like cooperative and mentorship, so to speak, right? Because some founders like, they're delusional on the wrong type of way, right? Yeah. And how do you have those conversations? I deal with it a lot. I mean, it happens a lot. Not a lot. Fortunately, I have some great teams that under, that have a great deal of self-awareness and, and are very experienced, more experienced than me. I think it really comes down to trust. Um, founders that work with 360 trust that we have their best intentions in mind when we work with them. They believe that we are there to help them. And because of that, we're able to access parts of their themselves that are left uncovered by working with other people. You know? Um, and so I really think it comes down to the strong, the strength of, of the, you know, we, take a lot of our own personal time with teams. You know, like last week I met with four of my interns, af you know, on my own time after either brunch or, you know, after work, giving time to people. They, they didn't, it's not like they needed anything. They just wanted time to talk about what they're going, where they're going in their lives. As a founder, I'm extremely lonely. Oftentimes, because not only am I a founder, but I am also the leader of a group of other founders. And so even my own colleagues now are still 
like I own parts of their companies. You know, so like, who do I really talk to when I have an issue with about them? You know, and so I have had to build my own network of advisors and mentors. I'm not going to them asking for money. I'm going to them asking them, how can I make this thing better? Like, what am I missing? What do I need? What, you know, who can you share with me? Um, and I think that's the piece that has continued to dr put us on this, the right path forward. Do you see yourself expanding this model like to different cities? I do. Um, this is a, this is, this is a model. Uh, well, maybe, uh, you know, let, let me just say, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're basically, to, um, the way I designed it was to be designed as an innovation cluster. Okay. Um, and what we're doing differently is how we're training people to interact with each other. We take the time, we build a whole curriculum about how to talk to a founder, right? Like, do you know their name? <laughs> do you know their business? Do you know what they do? Do you know what, what they're asking for, you know? Like, maybe you should know those things before you jump on a call with a founder who just spent three weeks preparing to have this conversation with you. Yeah, that's, that's so frustrating, right? You see it all the time. It's, yeah, it's just pathetic. It's yeah. Just, it's criminal. It is. I mean, and think about how much time that person has robbed from that business who could have been investing their time in things that, or somebody that actually cared. That's the difference. We don't, we won't introduce you to them. We'll say, you know what? We just, we're like, we're still trying to find the right, you know, alignment that will provide you with the success that you're trying to achieve. Our founder, I can tell you in the last four months, I probably had two or three founders say no to money from founders, from investors that they didn't want on their cap table because of how they've been treated by those people in the past. Can you talk some about the education things you do for your founders? Yeah, of course. I mean, besides providing, you know, like world-class education, you know, I think one of, you know, we do a lot of stuff around human-centered design. My chief of staff, Ed Parody, is, has a degree in human-centered design. I have a number of certifications and I teach it professionally. You know, we try and, and again, these things are, you know, we're, we're not reinventing the wheel, the lean, lean canvas, you know, um, the journey map. You know, these are things that have not, have been done many times before. I think the difference is, you know, and I'm sure, well, I can, I can probably speak for both of us here when I say we've both been in the same program where we've gone to workshops, accelerator programs that are just workshop after workshop after workshop. There's no workbook. There's no time for questions. And you leave that education without even anything in your hand. We will ensure that every work, every activity, every engagement that you do with us at 360, you will leave something that you will be able to use for your business, whether it be your mile updating your milestones, whether it be a, you know, a, um, an, you know, an updated value story map, whether it's, you know, um, one pagers or a commercial that we're working on for you, like it will be quality, you know? And I think that there's, there's some to be said about that. So when a startup founder is thinking about reaching out to you, should they be at like a minimal level? Like, should they be like past the idea stage to have MVP or like, I guess like, what, what is too early for them to reach out to you? My team will be mad if I don't say not mad but would be frustrated because yes considering we're you know i personally started off any team that wanted to be a part but i recognize that that's not the best use of our resources so what i would say that we that teams are best aligned with us that are pre-seed through seed stage teams so we know pre-seed the definitions of pre-seed and seed have changed so yeah. much in the last yeah. That I think it's yeah. just like, you know, up through their first round, 
right? So um, where we can provide the mentorship, the access to, like, I would say the number one thing that we excel at is global market access. Okay. Um, you know, there we have a reach. Like, you want to go to Australia? I've got contacts who will build you and develop your pathway to open a new market in 12 months. Okay? You want to go to Taiwan? We can make that happen, right? Want to go to India, Canada? Like, we have programs and pathways and relationships that we built to help companies enter new markets like that, okay? Um, but I would still say you have to have an idea, and you probably have to have at least an idea of how it's going to work because we can build, I mean, no code stuff. Now we could, you know, build Easy stuff, build MVP diagrams. Yeah. Just show me your wireframe and you know, we can build it. So, um, I would say that if, if you already have an established network and, and you're coming to us to, to close out a round or to, you know, add to your accolades of programs that you've been accepted to. It's not a good fit. Okay. And um, I would say you have to be comfortable with being a little bit disruptive. Like, we didn't get here by accepting the status quo. There's a lot of other founders, a lot of other leaders, even in this community, in the Seattle area, who are not, no, who could use their position of power to advocate more for the voices that are still yet to be represented, you know? Um, and I think that's evidenced by, you know, like, think about, you know, who's getting these recognitions and awards. About stuff like Geek Wire, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I was nominated for the... For um, and I didn't even know that I was. So I was nominated for the um, um, Uncommon Thinkers. Seems like they have a pretty diverse group. Um, but you know the there are other awards. You know I wonder like, are, so I'm I'm I I don't have much to say about that. You know any specific one, but I'm saying that I think there are certainly things that we both go to where we're like, hmm maybe we've seen them get this before or like they just got that and it makes us think like who's judging you know who's nominating who's in charge because that's really where the decisions are made yeah my cousin geekwire has always been like they're always like once you raise like a 10 million dollar fund then they get on your radar oh yeah like who's out there if like the founders who need twenty five thousand dollars they're not struggling right there's nothing out there yeah. you know geekwire hasn't yet done a on me um you know they've done a ton of stuff on tech stars and all their teams yeah um yet you know i was a little surprised to hear that some of their teams formed just a couple months before applying to the program you know so i and i wonder like you know u-dub is no no bravo um you know u-dub is so apparently i guess they're they are very aligned and uh seem to be doing a lot of work with um um what is it uh pack ventures you know i'm sure you've been to several of those events as well okay. um should we pause for a second no no, no okay no. yeah um you know where they've been to a couple of those events as well where it's like uh, you know only you know there's a lot of other venture capitalists in the UW ecosystem um there's a lot of other incubators in the Ubidav ecosystem. Um, and so I think, you know, it's it's very, and I'll admit, there are people that don't like what we're doing or feel com competed with and, you know, or how we say what we're doing is, you know, could be better. Yeah, my, that's okay. My criticism too is like, like a lot of these people, like, do we really need another HR recruiting app? Like, mm -hmm. do we really need another, you know, bicycles, you know? Or another incubator. Yeah, do we need another last, uh, it's like yeah, it's like it's the same thing over and over again. Yeah, right? they they're and, recycling. And, and my thing too, like, is is tech really solving big problems, right? Like delivery app is not a big problem, right? Like last mile, you can walk, right? It's like well, it is. It, let me use an example of that last mile for 
plug another team, Bob Bob Technologies. Um, you know, they're a team that we've been working with who developed um, a DAI, a, a, what is it, decentralized address infrastructure, um, where they are solving or trying to solve. They just got a big contract with the city of Nairobi um, through Department of Commerce. So they were down there on a, on a step grant um, we connected them with. Um, to try and address the last mile issue of of delivering things to the continent of Africa, right? So, like, I okay, tried to ship that, a, that's different. Yeah, that's a little different. But different. you know, there the, in the U.S., maybe somebody would say DAI is not a, not necessary. But that's why it's so important we take a global perspective at 360 because I've been told a lot of times, oh, that's not valuable here. Like, what are you, you know, real where? Why do we need remote assistance in the U.S.? We've got Zoom. We've got all these other things. Well, the only thing that they wanted to talk about when I went to Australia was remote assistance. So, you know, I it it really is about being open to not settling for thinking, is this good enough here or there? But, like, I really want to know, does this add value? And maybe it doesn't here, but... You know, I feel like it's important for us to continue to look, and it, it has to be new. I'm like I've already, we've already said it. I'm so bored with AI. I'm bored with you know like generative you know all these crypto. I'm bored with <laughs> you know blockchain. I'm bored with NF, F, NFTs. You know, um, because it's like those are. I don't think they're adding much value. You know. Um, and certainly a lot of the companies that we see around that are getting investment aren't even going to be around in a couple of years. They don't even tend to be CEOs of a, their company or, you know, build something that actually becomes like known. And that's a real shame because, you know, it's the Adam Newman's that are getting those checks in front oh of. God. We want to go to that, but uh, next. How do you help your companies or founders with the process of customer discovery? You know, again, it comes down to, we have to help them ask good questions. You know, we get a lot of founders, I think, that sometimes come in and like think they've already solved the problem too. You know, like, ah, oh, we've got this great solution. And then they go out and they have to, you know, ask questions and it makes them really question whether or not, and that's the whole point, right? Is to question whether or not um, their product is, you know, is worthwhile. So I think we start by taking a really deep dive into looking at the questions that they're asking. What do you want to know about the customer? Um, somebody that I'm really impressed with for customer discovery is actually Alan Gonzalez. Yeah, Alan Gonzalez, like he showed me his country flying, like, dude, like you, I told him you should be like teaching this like some kind of like yeah. startup incubator or something, right? This shit is like so detailed. Yeah, I told him a little I, too detailed. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, like I, you know, I, I won't give away too much of his model, but you know, I wouldn't necessarily say we need to categorize quite as deeply, but the process of getting there was fascinating. I went to, you know, I, I'm one of a, an advisor for. For um, for them and actually a couple, three of my team, two of my teams have been customers with Alan, um, Litmus and yeah, I and found Plaza. my developer using using Alan. Okay, so email. there you go. Um, you know, so I've been a big supporter, and I think the the cool thing is, you know, really doing the persona development. We do that too. I want my teams to know what is the customer segments and the personas, you know, their buying behaviors, so that when we're developing question sets for them, you know, like with, for example, working with a company connect my variant, Dr. Shirts, I've been trying to develop out this program for um, oncologists or, or for, or for uh, sorry, genetic cancer care, you know, going to um, breast reconstructive surgeons, you know, um, other types of, you know, doctors that inter interact with, with um, cancer patients with cancer. And we've had to ask, like, okay, doctors, like, what value, you know, would, do you want to see out of some type of program that would 
help enhance patient care versus a family that says like, what type of information do you expect to get when you go to a doctor for cancer treatment? And then a family member that might be like, what information would be helpful for you to know where to direct your loved one that's looking for information? You know, so really understanding those different roles, the different jobs to be done, and the personas of those, um, you know, um, customer segments helps us really partner with those teams to ask the right questions. And then LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, there's no place better than to find. Yeah. So looking forward, right? So obviously all the, all the companies or startups in your, your, your studio, obviously you believe in all of them because you let them in, right? And let's look at the future, you raise your $100 million fund. Like, how are you going to decide who to invest in, right? Like, you know, like, let's say you have 100 companies there, but obviously you can't invest money in all 100 companies. That Why not? I mean, you're going to have a little, I mean, even if you raise a hundred million dollar fund, you know, like, unless you just invest like a million dollars. I mean, I don't know. Maybe well, I, I, I'll i start by saying I'd invest money in all of the teams that 360 has in our portfolio right now. Okay. Um, And I intend to make investments in at least half of those teams. Okay. Um, Is it like a minimal level investment you're thinking about making or like? You know, this like was great? interesting. I've been thinking hard about this minimum, right? Um, And we've had a number of conversations with our with our team portfolio teams port coast um and one conversation really struck me we had teams when we were saying okay you know we would like to help we'd like you to start structuring what you your investments you, you'd like you know what you, what your ask is for quarter 1 um and they you know been coming back and saying well do we have to take all of the money at once can we take 25,000 and 50,000? I mean, that's a big challenge, right? A lot of founders, like, you know, I just need 100,000. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we only invest a million, right? Well, yeah. I don't need a million. I'll take a million, but like, I don't want to take a million because the cap implications, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So we, you know, we avoid that completely. You know, teams, like, yes, we may at some times tell teams they need to take more money because we say, hey, we need to see you get this level of resources to get to this number count, you know, or maybe it's like, you know, sales, like we just need to be hitting the numbers. So we're saying, yeah, we, we, we're going to give you a little bit more to make sure that you hit these de-risk maybe in some ways. Um, but I don't necessarily think that, you know, the, the government we're, we're looking to do an SBIC fund as well, which is a government matched uh, investment fund. A lot of red tape, lots of red and green coded letters. <laughs> like, um, but they will match the funds that we get uh, up to 175 million. Um, and so in two funds, so actually up to a 350 million, a lot of qualifications, but this is our target. I mean, this is my goal, right? So, um, and with that, they told us, you know, don't worry about your first fund. They said, honestly, we don't expect your first fund to return anything. And they said, we're looking at what, like, how quickly can you structure deals and get them out the door? I'm like, oh, shit, I don't even have, like this first <laughs> round. I can just, you know, it doesn't even matter, right? Like yeah. with 10 million, you know, they're not looking for us to make money. And actually, most people on their fu first fund don't. So they're just looking for us to practice structuring deals. My hope is I can get as many deals out the door with that first fund as possible. And you're looking like, dude, get, like when you invest, you're thinking about getting a, like a safe note, convertible note, like an actual equity price. Yeah, note. so we're investing using a redeemable warrant. Okay, okay, oh. Um, so you're going to be able to, so our mission when we set out was not to take equity from any team that we invested in. So we provide teams with five years to return the equity at a three X return. Um, and they have five years to return that they can't start paying until month 13, but in month one through 12, we partner them in, or we put each one of those founders into our sales uh, how to sell nothing program. So they have month really weekly touch points 
on some of those milestones in that first year of development before they may be pre-revenue or pre-net, you know, um, where we're really providing them with the tools and resources to start returning that money starting month 13th. Then they have four years to pay pay off the pay down the rest of that investment with the hope being that after five years, we hold no equity in the teams that we invested in. So you, you kind of answered this already, but we talked about the minimum to get in. When is the company too far along to get it into your studio? You know, maybe if you're like, if you've already raised 5 million, you know, you're probably a little, maybe 10. You know, again, these things are changing. Like, Maybe somebody doesn't want to be a part of 360 because of the money. And most didn't. Remember, we started by just being an incubator. We didn't have money. Now we're getting people that want to invest in them, but we didn't start like that. And so I want to keep it like that. I want people to come to us for the community and hope that maybe we will get, you know, Oniva, for example. You know, they were a team in our portfolio. She'd raised $8 million. Yet, is still coming back to utilize our network because of the introductions, the, you know, opportunities, you know, um, between, you know, the master's fund and 360, we brought, um, Oniva up twice this year. You know, she headlined our, um, our showcase at the, um, at startup hall or at founders hall for Seattle startup week, and then brought her up for them, um, her, the women in business awards that presented by Microsoft. You know, these are ways that we also support team. We didn't make an investment, but we've paid for two round trip tickets up and airfare and housing to come up for an award and pay for, you know, her to be at that event. Right. So like there are, and she's raised $8 million, you know? Um, so there's, I think, there's plenty of space for people to be in 360. If you're looking for us to support you, you should have a product or, you know, you should have a MVP or a product that you're looking to launch or introduce into a market and that you also need, you know, other pieces of your business that you may not have yet. So that's why we have a studio. Fractional CTO, project managers, analysts, you know. So... Founders, they need to be good storytellers, right? However, most founders are not natural at this. How do you help people become great storytellers? Well, I'm excited about a partnership that we just um, um, formed in the last month or so with Creator Source Studios. Um, Creator Source Studios is a BIPOC content creation lab um, that's actually going to be moving into our downtown uh, location as partners with us um, because we really recognize the need to help founders be better storytellers. Um, we, again, going back at 360, we do a lot of human-centered design. So I make teams do persona development. You know, I make them create user story maps, which is different than the journey map, which is like focused on jobs to be done. And this is more about what story do you tell at which phase of the customer journey to support the you know achievement of the jobs to be done. So when you're first, you know, listening to somebody, you're asking questions. Tell me, you know, how difficult has it been this year for you having to be, you know, on Zoom? Right? Like there's a lot of features there that, you know, we've heard people really don't like. Would you there's some that really stick out to you? You know, and trying to empathize and sympathize. Once we've done that, we can move on. We can, you know, be a, play a different role and helping founders really understand when to take what role. You know, you don't need a problem solver when somebody's trying to vent about, you know, like you don't need a partner yet if they don't know yet what the product is, right? These are ways that we help them, not only through sales, through some of those, you know, one-on-ones, but the the variety of service providers that we have enhance our ability. It's like, I'm not a great storyteller, but um, there's plenty of us, you know, there's plenty of our partners that really specialize in that. So from your point of view, 
what are some characteristics that founders need to have to be successful? Resilience. Thick skin. Um, they need to be fearless and relentless. You know, that's one thing that I think has gotten me where I am today, especially this last year. I am like relentless in my pursuit and mission to achieve the things that I've set out for our community. And like, I couldn't imagine how I could get here if I didn't have that same relentless determination to get to see this happen. I think that's why founders don't get what they want. It's, 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 of course, I have privilege, but you know, I still have to go out there and make it happen. It's one thing to dream, but it's a different thing to, to build your dream and to be able to have that dream be other people's. So Chandler, how do you take care of yourself both physically and mentally? I have really, really great close friends that, and an incredible family and partner that give me enough of what I need to, well, and, you know, not just people that are with me today, you know, um, I think there's a lot of people that aren't with me today that also are cheering for my, you know, the success, our success. Um, and that work ethic, I think that I get from my family, you know, um, helps me realize that even though, yeah, I'm probably burnt out, you know, um, a little bit sometimes, who isn't? when they're building a business, you know, my sense of loyalty to my job, my full-time job, the fact that I'm still there 40 hours a week and also doing other things, you know, there's certainly some mental health. It's not great all the time, but like great leaders have to sacrifice things on behalf of the people that they serve. And my sacrifice is sometimes my mental health. Um, it's never been, I'm blessed to never have let that, you know, like I'm the most, I'm the happiest 99.5% of the time I wake up every morning and I'm just so darn excited to get to work that like, I just can't, I just get right out of bed. Like I bite myself to go to sleep at night. I'm like, I can do one more thing, but, um, I'm getting better at, at recognizing that I need one full day of rest a week. And then what are some of your hobbies? What do you like to do for fun? I like to work. <laughs> I love to travel. Um, you know, I've flown over 140,000 miles this year. Um, about to go to, um, um, you know, Doha and Abu Dhabi and um, Dubai here um, for a big investor conference and closing a partnership with, with the seed group. Then my coming back Christmas and then I'm off somewhere sunny with my husband for one final trip of the year. So like I, these, this is really how I, my way I recharge my batteries by traveling. Um, and that's like also just so many other opportunities that I get, you know, worlds I get to see by traveling. So your studio is in a lot of countries. What's a country you're not in yet that you, that you want to go into? That's a hard question. Well, I would love to be in Taiwan um, or Mexico. You know, I seen a lot of innovation in Taiwan. Actually, my husband, you know, my husband's father invented the OLED, um, the OLED. And so, you know, like hearing the stories of all the technology development and, you know, the, the chip manufacturing and you know i still think they're coming here to look for innovation programs and like you know incubated founders institutes now in taiwan you know so like 
I think there is a genuine interest and excitement around the world of innovation in Taiwan. And I think the culture, you know, I, I have an affinity for, for Taiwan and the people of Taiwan. Um, but then Mexico too, I, you know, this last time I was down in Mexico, you know, I see s uh, so much opportunity, um, you know, opportunity for organizations to come in and provide pathways for the improvement of entire culture. So I think those are two places. I think culturally they'd also are a little bit easier for Americans to, to get into. I speak en enough Spanish that probably in a year I'd be fluent enough that it could be, you know, another useful thing. What's the country you travel to that you, that you had a really good time at, but most Americans like you had a good time there. Like that's not possible, right? If that makes any sense. Well, the East coast is a place that I go to when I just feel like I don't have any fun. Mm -hmm. Um, like I'm not a big New York fan, not a big, just that whole, you know, it's just a lot of, a lot of tall buildings yeah. and people that are just rushing by. Uh, I love Sweden. I think my favorite country in the world, I've been there about six or seven times. Um, you know, Berlin is another place that I just... Yeah, Berlin is a great city. Yeah. Places that I maybe had less of a great experience. Like France. France. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> um... You know, I mean, I think it was probably just the way they treat Americans. Like, yeah, we. I know I don't speak French. Yes, I'm not saying pont au chocolat correctly, you know. Um, but I just felt like, of all places, they made me feel the least welcome as an American. Um, but it's not like I wouldn't go back. I mean, they also arguably have the most incredible art collection in the world. Yeah, and the like, Blue the Museum is just outstanding. You know, there. but like maybe places where I had the worst experience as a tourist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Sorry about that. It's, it's maybe it's, you know, Parisians in specific. <laughs> but, uh... So what's your goal for yourself moving forward? Like, what do you see? What's what's success for you moving forward? You know, I came, I, I believe that, the highest form of what I could do in life is to be of service to other people. Um, and what that looks like for me and why, I, you know, this year really why I set out on doing the fund and starting the incubator was because like, for me, I, I want to have my own, I do have my own business now, but I want to get to the point where I can take other people's money and find ways, orchestrate, you know, connect people to create the most impact, but also bring the generational wealth to the communities that have not had that. And that's what I want for myself. I'm doing this because I believe that there is a different way to do business. I will never be satisfied with where I am, you know, it, it, personally, like not necessarily what I've done, but with how much I have left to learn. I hope that this opportunity provides me with a pathway where I can continue learning the rest of my life and hopefully along the way, bring impact to as many people as possible. It was for you. What's gonna have to happen for you to quit your full-time job? <laughs> I made a commitment this year actually. Um, and you know, so I applied for the, Economic Development Administration's um, um, a fellowship for was the Economic um, Recovery Corps Fellowship, two hundred thirty thousand dollar fellowship with a twenty five thousand uh, dollar travel stipend over thirty months, um, and I told myself if I got the fellowship, I would for thirty months I would focus on circle of, or on on three sixty. Now, as it turns out, Washington was one of only three states that did not get selected as a host site. So I got a notification that uh, there were no there were no programs to pair me with in my region. 
So unfortunately, I did not end up getting a fellowship. Um, I was waitlisted. Um, and so I'm still working in that role. So what it, I, but I told my boss yesterday, I won't be here in 12 to 18 months. And I told her, and we started, we talked very squarely about a transition plan. Cause like I could do more if I did this full time too. You know, we were revenue positive this year and I worked full time. I could only imagine if I did this all the time. It would be, but again, these are choices that I don't know if I'm quite ready to give up my other thing, even though everybody tells me I should be. So for the people, for your fun, for your studio, the people you hire, your interns, the chief of staff, these companies that you hired, what kind of qualities do you look in for these people when you hire them and bring them on? What values, qualities, virtues, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. I look for a little bit of a, a sense of, like a little bit of a dreamer you know everybody that is on our team has described to me a vision of a future that doesn't yet exist um you have to be coachable um and you you have to be willing to say i take ownership for the things that i want to contribute um, and maybe I don't know how to do those things yet, but like, once I take responsibility, I will figure it out right now until three months ago, all of my team were volunteers, all my entrepreneurs and residents, all my team, maybe five months ago. Um, and we're now getting to the point where we can pay, you know, like I pay two or three people now part time. Um, you know, and so seeing the what things in them, I would say they never once have asked about what they needed. You know, I actually get annoyed at one of my entrepreneurs and residents. Brian, if you're out there listening, I'm going <laughs> to give you a shout out here because I actually have to annoy him to send me invoices. Like, dude, I want to pay you. <laughs> like, you know, and it's not first of mine for these folks. Um, so that's really, you know, you don't have to have a specific talent or treasure. I want people that that are committed to doing whatever it takes to create a different world. Um, and the people that are with me now are ones that have been with me for a while too, because they've, they have that same dream. Um, maybe we're all a little bit dreamers, you know, uh, cause we could sit around and talk about how the way the world should be forever. The follow question it might be a tougher one, but like what, what does someone have to do or, or not do for you say, Hey, you know, Billy Bob or Mary Jane, this ain't working out right. We hired you the values match, but now you know we're going a different direction. How do you how do you approach those kind of things, those conversations? You know, I had I had a conversation like that recently. Um, I mean, I I'm okay with it. <laughs> you know, I'm the top. I had a boss once. So many um, people are not, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I know. I had a boss once, and I actually let my project manager go. You know, we couple not on 360 from another team a couple months ago. You know, and I, I had a boss, she's cold, she was cold, but actually I don't think it's as cold as it sounds. She would bring people into the office at the, on Friday at four o'clock and she'd say, I just wanted to let you know that today was your last day. And we just want to give you an opportunity before other people start clocking out and things to get your stuff. We'll pay you through the end of the day, but today was, that was it. They can't argue. You've already terminated them. It's already done. That wash is at will. What? Yeah. Fire people for every reason you want yeah. to. Um, that's how I fire people. Not everybody, of course. I mean, I wouldn't fire my assistant like that. But like, you know, or how I do with partners. Like, it's, you know, just want to let you know, this isn't working out. You know, and I, it's better to let you know now than give you another few months to figure it out. Like, it, wasting everybody's time. 
Yeah. And one thing like people don't realize, like everyone knows you should let the people go, right? Like everyone like, man, you know, Jason's been messed up for too much. Chandler got rid of what's going on, right? Yeah. And then it starts to be a, a it starts to make you look bad yeah. as a leader. Yeah. Like exactly. why, you know, they're like, why are we holding on to this person? Yeah. I you gotta cut it quick because they're a, you know, and I think I'm sure I was listening to this. Who was it? Um Kevin O'Leary. You know, you've got to cut it because it's like a disease, dude. It, it spreads. It is. One person that's complaining about management to another, to another, to the customers, to the clients, to your business. And then you're like, whoa, like, who started this? Yeah. So you got to get rid of them quick. Um, and no hard feelings, but it's not. But as always, I can't fire Jason. It's his birthday. Or it's Christmas. All this, all this. And the next thing you know, Jason's been there for three months. And people looking at you sideways like, man, what's going on here, right? And like Jason gets away with it. And all your good employees start performing the lowest standard. Yeah. Well, that's why you always have to have a high standard, right? And I think my team is aware, you know, I'll call them out, you know, like, or they'll call me out. Like, we need, you know, really need your attention on this. Um, but I think people have a pretty good internal sense themselves, even if they don't. They know. They know. They know. They, they know. know. They know. So it sometimes just takes like, yeah, I'm not going to fire you, but I'll make, I'll, I will make you hold your commitment and whether you choose to do that or not will be the ter termination of whether you stay. So this might be a tough one for you or maybe not, but can you highlight two or three of your companies or studio that you're really like proud of or like really doing impressive work? Yeah. So many. Oh my goodness. Um, let's see. Litmus. Um, industrial, uh, digitizing industrial log sheets for manufacturing petrochemical. One of my newest partners just signed a JV with him and uh, Madhu Verma of B Team Labs. Um, I would say Madado Health. Uh, Madado Health is a um, is a consent management platform for healthcare uh, for patients um, to choose and control access to health information that you know that. They decide. Um, let's see. Um, PedTrack. Uh, they're creating a um, a pedal pulse monitor um, that will mo for lower extremities or um, that will monitor pulse, temperature, quality. Uh, there's so many. Um, Community Circle. Um, you know they're building an application to uh, improve or decrease shelter fragmentation. Um, in metropolitan areas. Um, community Collaboratory uh, is out there creating a neighborhood, a localized neighborhood strategy for community and mutual aid to individuals that need support. Uh, let me think, a couple more. Um, I don't want to forget anybody. About, yeah, it's like, oh, that's good. So here's another question for you. What's a company in your, your in there that's like, like you, you believe what they're doing? They're doing good work, but you're like, man, like this might be some year 2200 stuff. I don't know if it's realistic in twenty twenty three. You understand the concept, but science is not there yet. Was that kind of like a moonshot, so to speak, right? I that's like that's my team, <laughs> honestly. Like V Team Labs Technologies, we're getting in the DigiLens headset, um, like next week, and. I don't know if you've heard of the movie or the, the game, um, the video game, Eliza, which is a mental health counselor, AI counselor, uses, you know, haptic feedback and wearable. Well, we're, it's a game, but I was like, let's build it. And then, you know, I met Jeff Kent yesterday at the Foster Strategy Competition, and they're building a technology that you, pairs wearables and generative AI, which would be the perfect complement to the platform that we're building but it's totally 2045 and what's the name of the company again b team labs technologies um you know so like and digilens is the name of the platform it was just the the headset argo was just launched at ces consumer electronics show last year and just hit the market for early developer um you know like in the last quarter uh so we really are one of the first companies organizations to get our t hands on this wave 
like, you know, uh, industrial wearable technology. Um, and it is futuristic. Like we're thinking, you know, entertainment, healthcare, you know, retail, all the different, but it's like not today. Okay. I have a note to talk about something called where is it realware.com? Yeah, realware. Okay. Yeah. So realware is the our our wearable assisted reality headset partner. Um they're they're built in uh Vancouver, Washington. Um, and they are an Android headset basically on and voice controlled on your head. I would have brought it for you today, Jason, but I my interns have it. Um and they're a little spoiled because I just bought them a drone, the real wear headset, and I just spent five thousand dollars on a DigiLens headset for them all to do development on. So none of those things are currently with me. <laughs> um, but they are such like they really are the future, I think, of of wearable technology. You know, something that's like doesn't look like a <laughs> geek when you know doofus when you put it on your head and have no you know punch a hole through a wall because you don't know where you are um you know i think this really is industry 4.0 so is there anything i should have asked that i haven't or you guys want to talk about you know i mean what i would love to just spend a little bit of time talking about is is the venture fund um because i want people to know why this is such an important part of our work. Um, I didn't want to get into venture capital. I actually, if I could spend less time with the people that I'm now spending more time with, I would. Because it's it's so transactional and it's just not, it's not me, right? And so that's pushed me Beyond where I, you know, instead of just trying to be a venture capitalist that follows the norm, that fits the model, that is the, you know, is is the model BIPOC investor. It's not my thing. And I'm, you know, I'm disappointed in a lot of the other Black BIPOC female investors that have taken their seats at the table and said, I've made it. And that's good enough um, without looking at the, you know, the line of people behind them that they could be opening the doors for in, in their positions now. And so I think somebody has to do that. Somebody has to take that charge. Um, we're doing this because we recognize that somebody has to be the first one to invest in the founders that we do that by looking outside of the US, looking to Africa, looking to, um, you know, Australia, you know, outside, we are able to find ways to make more impact with the same money. We will do something completely different. And I want I, I encourage people to underestimate the work that we're doing, right? Um, because the best way, you know, like the best payback is massive success. And if you, you know, you've known me for a little bit, Jason, but I can tell you I'm committing and will not stop until our fund and our ventures are massive success. Um, and so that's, that's really like, just want to make sure people know we're doing it because who else? If not us, then who? Um, and we're not stopping until it's an outrageous success. So when raising a venture fund, are there like any rules or regulation laws that say, like, supposedly, like, you know, based on political stuff, like, you can't raise from Qatar, you can't raise from Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. you can't raise money from different locations, or, 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 you, or you can just raise whenever you want to? I'm going to, I'm, you know, our venture fund, of course, is high, is, under the same regulation, you know, SEC regulations and reporting and requirements and taxation, all those things. But, um, you know, I don't necessarily, we've made it very difficult for our LPs or kept our LPs as far away from decision making as possible. Um, pretty much no input into how the fund is run. So I really don't care who gives us money. 
because we're going to take that money and we are going to stay committed to the roadmap that we have for impact. Um, and yeah, if, you know, if Putin wants to give us a hundred million dollars, you know, and say to make himself feel better, it doesn't matter because we're going to take that hundred million and we're going to amplify Yeah, that kills me people say I'm not going to spend money because the values don't lie. Yeah. But I think what you can do with that money. It's true. I mean, not taking it hurts more people than taking it. At least that's how I, like, how could taking, you know, a billion dollars and feeding 20, you know, 50 million people, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, how does that hurt somebody more than rejecting their offer to help? Yeah. And what, what's that? Do you have a name for your fund? Yeah, it's called Enough Ventures. Okay, Enough Ventures, okay. That's really because, you know, and, and I'll again credit this to Amika, you know, I really believed for a while that I was the right one to lead the fund as, you know, managing director. And I am. But I, Amika took my vision of innocent entrepreneurship and innocent, you know, ventures. And is she the managing director now? Or are you still the managing director? I'm still the managing director, but, but Amika will be a core part of, you know, and a partner and a core part of our vision. But he gave us this idea of, you know, enough. Like we are enough. We've had enough. Um, you know, the what we're having to put up with, you know, it's enough. Right. And so um spent enough time doing things the way they didn't work and we're gonna change. So <laughs> this idea I feel really moved our vision forward and gave us not just a, a mission or a vision, but a platform to be able to say it's enough. Like we're doing it differently from today on. And, you know, admittedly, some of the partners that I've had along with me wanted to do something different, but do it the same way. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Right. And like, well, they're no longer partners because, you know, it's not anything against them, but their vision, their clarity, their intention was not clear enough or strong enough to really materialize. And that's not everybody's, not everybody's made or capable of doing that. And have you already started raising the fund? Not officially yet because we have to close, you know, yes, we've been talking to a num, you know, and courting a number of investors and institutions. Um, but we can't officially solicit until we have, a. Uh, FCC registered funds. So we, okay. so, um, haven't been distributing any, you know, letters, haven't been talking about our capital commitments or, you know, asking for any commitments yet either. Um, other than here's our vision, here's our thesis, and, uh, here's some of the first teams that we want to invest in. So how are you going to deal with this? Like when people find out you have this fund, you probably get like, you already get a lot of emails now already. You yeah. probably, probably get like, like double the amount, right? But let me, let me phrase that. How do you want founders to reach out to you? They're going to invest. Is it going to be only for your, your studio only investment? Can people from like, we'll say Kenya. Yeah, University? they are. They do. So. Actually. Um, I, I would say reach out. Like we want, we have, we've built a team that has the capacity to meet and, you know, meet founders all over the world. Um, we're across time zones. We're across states. We're varied by experience. Um, veterans. You know, civilians. Yeah, you know, we've got we've got them all, right? Um, and so, I want to empower my entrepreneurs and residents, our team members, other teams, to have conversations with people that we work with already. You know, um, you know, Eddie has had conversations with some people in our teams. Le uh, Leanne, you know, from Plausible has talked to some teams before they've worked with us, uh, and we want them to. Like, have a conversation with somebody that's in our community and see if what we do, what our vision is, what our mission is, aligns with yours. Maybe we give you resources, maybe we don't, but as a community, we're stronger together, right? So maybe it's just a name on a list. You know, you're a part of, you commit to these organizational commitments, but, you know, Nine names isn't quite as good as 10. 
right? And like we're there to to meet people where they are. And people should feel comfortable coming to us no matter where they are. They're not ready, we'll find somebody that helps you. They're too far, we'll find somebody that does that, right? So back to the, the I think it's called the 17 UN. Yeah, the 17 on. goals. UN goals for sustainable development. All those, like, have they had them the same for, like, decades? Do they change every year? Or? No, I think they've been, they stay the same. Okay. This is a pretty long-term mission um, strategy that, uh, that maybe the, maybe they've changed the impact metrics, but they haven't changed the goals. And, like, and so in order to get your steer, you have to be that aligned with one of those things, right? Let's say you're like a solid alignment, it can be kind of like gray, it can be like loosely aligned. We so like for example, Jiva Health, another one of the companies, and Sadaka Kashik, the CEO, founder CEO, who used to run um, Verizon Wireless's incubator uh, while he w- worked for them. You know, they have a great platform that's focused on mental health, youth mental health. They have a pr- platform called Jiva Health an app you get on the app store um and yeah like for example you know they fall under health and well-being right but it's also could be you know reduced inequalities could be for the education or for access to health care um you know it could be a quality education right like educating partnering with you know academic institutions schools after school programs to talk about mental health, right? To let them know like, hey, TikTok isn't the best place to get your, you know, mental health information. Um, you know, so I think there's, we help them find those submetrics. But maybe, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say we're going to, you know, like, I don't know if a bullet bourbon would be the best fit for our, yeah. like, I'm not sure what impact metric that that would have. Maybe, you know, but I'm open, you know, we could be convinced too. You will let them convince you. Sometimes. As long as the story's there. Okay. So do you have like a personal assistant or executive assistant? I do. A few <laughs> between my different teams. Okay. I have a full-time project manager and coordinator for my consulting role. I have a chief of staff and like project manager, two project managers at 360 who are part-time and like five other part, part-time entrepreneurs in resident. Um, and yeah, and then we have like between Madhup and I, uh, we share some shared operational infrastructure with um, global operations with some of his team. So we have, Six months ago, I would have told you I was doing a lot of this myself. You were talking about Samba. Can you talk about how, like, you, like, manage your interns? Like, how you make sure your interns get value from working with you? Oh, yeah. I've been working at UW for, you know, seven years now doing student programs. And I built it by working with the organizations and companies that that we support and partner with. Having them come up with job descriptions of things that they would like for students to do. I post those on Expo, UW Expo, where it's service learning. We have a very defined objective. So weekly meetings plus, you know, one weekly reflection to do Sunday night at five every week. Regardless of the program that you're in, they have to do their reflection. And we've just built a program that now we, you know, students can register. We do orientations week one and every single week for 10 weeks, they go through our programs and meet with their, the leads from this, you know, either founders or the leads from the companies that they're partnering with. Then they write a weekly reflection for me. And that's, I've now put through over 700 students, 600 students. Six, over 650 students in the last seven years through our program. Um, in the, just in the last two years, we had 4,700 hours of community experiential learning that our, our students did with us. Um, I, you know, the meaning comes from letting them determine where they're, you know, 
what they're interested in exploring and empowering them with the tools, time, you know, the space to have conversations about that and then to practice it in the real world. So how long have you lived in Seattle? Since 2010. So Seattle has a lot of neighborhoods. Do you have a favorite neighborhood in Ooh, Seattle? Ooh, I love Ballard. Ballard, yeah. Um, especially like Ballard Ave where all the food is just good. I like Capitol Hill. You know, it's nightlife. Um, you know, I I do like the Roosevelt neighborhood. I think it's kind of, you know. Where's that at? Just north of U District. Okay. Um, oh, the train. The, yeah. The train goes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because it's like there's a bunch of new little restaurants and things around there and the, the light rail stations there. Um, so, yeah. Those are nice. Yeah. So, what's something about you that, that here's a question for you. What's something that you've done that you're proud of that most people don't know about? Professional or personal? Yeah. Well, um, you know, maybe something personally that people don't know is like I was born with club feet. Um, and so when I was born, doctors told my parents that they'd never thought I would walk. Um, and I've always... I have all, you know, one of the reasons I don't wear shorts or things is because I have, you know, one of the, one of the um, symptoms is like having relatively underdeveloped calf muscle. Um, but, you know, I never really let that stop me from, from doing the things that I wanted to. So one of those things was being a tennis player. Um, and for me, Becoming a professional tennis coach, a high performance tennis coach, um, and having people see me in shorts. To me, that's, I know I like, I'd love to come up with something that's not personal because I, but this for me, you know, I, most people don't know this about me. Uh, I don't, you know, I'd say 99% of people may know, but have never seen, you know, or like reacted, you know, had a chance to really understand what that means. And I think it's so easy to judge other people by what we see on the outside. Um, and this is translated, I think, a lot to me, but the the experience of having this disability, this, you know, deformity, whatever it is, and then overcoming that to prove to not to anybody else, but to prove to myself that like pain is a part of the process. You know, like I have fixed ankles. So like I don't jump the same way as people do. Like basketball is not my game. But tennis for me was something that, yeah, like you have to love something enough for it to hurt. And for me, that was tennis. You know, and it's always that little piece of me that reminds me, like, the choice could have been to stay in a wheelchair. The choice could have been to make excuses for not getting myself, my body to the point that it could support itself. You know, and so I think there's always the choice to just stay in bed. There's always the choice, like my parents would say, to stay in the tub, right? That's what I used to do as a kid, just stay in the tub and knock it out. But, you know, you will never know how far you can go until you push yourself through probably a pretty decent amount of pain. Whatever that means, mental, physical, emotional, nothing that we get in this world comes without pain. Um, and how you deal with that pain and that challenge, I think is the ultimate judge of your character. Do you think some like people like, like yourself, your focus, your driven ambition, do you think people like yourself are just born like that? Do you learn to do it? Like what, like why do some people have it, whatever it is, and some people, some people are dissatisfied like working a nine to five and watching Netflix all day long? I don't know about anybody else, but for myself, I think I had great role model. Like, I was blessed to have 
parents that were both involved in my life, grandparents that were present, literally next door, you know, like aunts and uncles that were present, cousins that were present, and the privilege to see that what I was doing or what I could do now, you know, would never be hampered by in a in access or inability to pay. Um, and so I think the, you know, those, yeah, those were child, like overcoming, you know, kind of recognizing those opportunities allowed me to think, you know, this is a great way to put it. I was raised with the ability to think if you could never fail, like, what could you achieve? If you, if you knew it was impossible to fail, what would you do? What was the saying? If you can uh, dream it, you can achieve it or something yeah. like that? Yeah, but but this is more like, I get the where if you could dream it, you could achieve it. But this is like more about the, the, um, the freedom to think of di differently about a problem and come up with something that's never been done before yeah. and having the confidence and the boldness to follow it you know because learning still takes place yeah right doesn't have to be right or wrong but bringing standing behind something and following it through um that's the different i think i i just had those examples you know that's where very important. a lot of people don't have that right no and scouts you know like you don't well, I just think in my life, I didn't have the privilege of starting things and not finishing them. You know, um, if you start it, finish it and finish it so that if somebody else comes along and looks at it, they won't go, that's really shitty work, yeah. you know? Um, so to me, even if I'm exhausted and want to do something else now after two years of 360, I can't yet. Yeah. So at 360... Do you just provide off a desk and Wi-Fi? Like, like, like the conference room in there, computers? Like, what's all in the office that you saw? Found yeah, so in our office, we have 12 hot desks, um, workstations, two private offices, a conference room. Um, you know, most of our teams work remotely. Um, and so what we, like, again, I say what we the most we provide is this regular and consistent communication and networking um you know the milestone we we like i can tell you exactly where the teams in my portfolio are today with their development and it's 24 7 access yep okay. key card nice and pin key two key cards and w well two key card access points and one door pin okay if you're thinking about security it's kind of going to weird, but like this office space you got, like, how do you decide? How do you pick this specific office space? I chose the Melbourne Tower down, you know, and this was controversial, um, Jason, because it's on Third and Pine. Oh yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's like um, it can be a rough spot. Yeah, but I chose it because of the concentration of transportation. It's a ninety-eight percent walk score. Yeah, students can come south. The grill's right there. Yeah, Link, right Link there. is right there. Restaurants are there. Um, you know, high place market right there, places there. Right there. Um, buses all come through um, First Avenue, and I wanted to make it accessible yeah. because what you what you don't see yet is is what we're building is in that space downtown it is a BIPOC equity lab, like a creator studio, where we really hope that it becomes a place for education. Or connecting people with healthcare, you know, information, having, you know, talks, uh, trainings, language access programs, um, and sir, like the building itself has a bunch of nonprofits in it. So like the um, um, the Northwest Immigrant Justice um, Program, av the um, uh, Advocates' Rights. Uh, there's the Public Defenders Association, NAPCA, the National Asian Pacific Center on Aging. A lot of nonprofits that we support 
in that building. And that's why I wanted to have it there because it can then further serve as a hub to support the work that those businesses are doing. All right. So Chandler, um, who are your mentors? Um, one of my longtime mentors is um, my grandmother. You know, I try to talk to her as much as I can. Again, she's 103, so she has not, you know, not the same talking to her as much anymore. Um, you know, Jillian, music at the Masters Fund uh, recently, uh, within the last years, you know, been an incredible um, mentor for me. Um, Madhu, Firma, uh, you know, one of my partners and colleagues. Um, Sadakar, <clears throat> Kashik, Jiva Health, um, Mike Lee, um, you know, um, Menlo Labs and, and um, Home Depot. You know, so there's a lot of people that, even some of my founders, you know, Margie, uh, Carol, um, Aaron Flaster from Community Collaboratory. You know, I look, I believe that I can learn something from anybody, but there are some people who have elevated the way I look at things this year and pushed me and challenged me to think about things beyond the capacity that I've had for them before. And so everybody that I named in that last group have given me a piece of that perspective that's gotten to me where I am today. All right. So use of the follow questions like, who are you mentoring? Also, you mentoring a lot of people, right? So I'll rephrase it like, who are you mentoring that's not like in, in your studio, not a founder, or like someone you're mentoring like outside the scope of you, what you do? I have some students, uh, one, you know, one student I worked with at the University of Washington, name's Alan, uh, Chris, probably, you know, he's, he's in our community, Chris, Ponce. Chris yeah. Ponsheim, he's in our community, but certainly, um, you know, he reached out to me specifically just to be a mentor on LinkedIn um, nine months ago. And, you know, we went out last night <clears throat> and he was just reflecting on like, I can't believe that this nine months, like we're here, um, you know, and so excited about the future. I have a lot of, I have a lot of people like that. Um, and just for, you know, the sake of, you know, I, I don't know if people want necessarily want to even, you know, hint at maybe who some of those other people are that I work with, but they, I'd say I work with five or six people on a consistent monthly basis. Um, and it's just like this, you know, it's, it's just talking about, you know, sometimes I help them write or write letters of recommendation or, you know, um, I've been this last week, I helped three students write their personal statements for their graduate program. Um, one started at graduate school and hates it. And it's like, <laughs> Why did I come here? <laughs> um, you know, so like, yeah, and <clears throat> Jason, and honestly, those are the things that really take the time, you know, like I missed a meeting yesterday because I was on a call with a mentor, you know, with a team that I, or in, an individual I mentor and I couldn't get off, you know. Um, those, that's the most, that's the most humble of, of, responsibilities and people don't realize like you're mentoring someone it's more for you than them right because you get so much from mentoring people i i don't know what what they get from <clears throat> but i can but i know that they get enough to come back every week yeah. ask for more time yeah um you know be the first ones that they ask when they need rec recommendation or you know uh when they are in tears and need somebody to talk to. Like I get a lot of those calls, Jason. Yeah. Do you already have one drink before we get out of here? Let's do it. Which one do you want to do? I want this bullet. Okay. Unless you have a recommendation. No, no there are. Okay. Three. Then yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. Should I? Yeah. Thank you, good sir. Yeah. That's good.
Well, I am Cheers. a whiskey fan, a bourbon. Do you have a favorite? Not really. I mean, bullets are go to go to. I like Buffalo Trace. Well, I like Buffalo Trace too. Yeah, I mean, so about two months ago, maybe four months ago, I went. I went a bourbon bit. I bought like fourteen bottles of bourbon. Wow. I like. So I just like try different ones. You know, um, this one's pretty good. This is actually most expensive one, Frank August. Ooh. This was like a hundred dollars, but it's really really tasty. You know. This one, I bought because it's a Texas. It's black at best. You know. It's yeah. Not that good. You know. Of course, like it's a Woodenville. Oh, I like the Woodenville. Yeah. You know, did my grandmother used to drink um, uh, Seagram Seven. I remember those days. Yeah, yeah I used to Seagram Seven too. Yeah. Yeah, and then my uh, drinking family when I was in college, I was in a fraternity. Yeah. I was wild turkey. Oh, oh man. Oof. I have to tell you this story. So, of course, you know. Well, first of all, I wish I go back in time. Like I, I got, I found world bourbon too late in life, right? Yeah. So I'm, you know, in high school drinking wild turkey or whatever, because it's a bad experience, right? Even today, the smell just like, ugh. So yeah. fast forward, like, so I used to go deep sea fishing every year. Uh -huh. Westport, right? So one year I went to my son, a couple of friends, right? And of course, you know, you got to be at the five in the morning to sign in. The boat leaves at six in the morning, right? So over there, of course, everyone has like these like little coolers, right? These two old guys, right? I mean, you could tell they lived the whole life in the sea, right? They're like 60s, 70s, like, what's the word? Sea worn, whatever it's yeah. called, right? They had a big ass cooler, right? Like bigger than they needed, right? And so the boat leaves at six in the morning. By 6 30 in the morning, the one guy tells the other guy, You think we can start now? The other guy, well, we should have started way before now, right? <laughs> and so they break out a gallon of water <laughs> and a case of Schaefer Light. Oh, they rough. started at 6 30. They were done at 7 30. And that smell was horrible, right? It was crazy. Those, those like 10 people on the, on the boat, those two caught 95% of the fish. Like they're the fucking fish rippers, right? I love it. And that smell is like, it's like, oh my God, I got ECC sick. I was done, right? And they're just like, I mean, hanging in there, hanging in there, like Kicking drinking it. water, right? Oof. Boy, I mean, I think, you know, the wild turkey probably killed all their other senses <laughs> um, yep. because, like, it's rough. Yeah. Um, no, these are great. I, you know, Woodenville is great to see that they, you know, like, it's great to have local yeah. Yeah. Uh, distilleries. Yep. You know, because um, I maybe I was spoiled, but growing up near Chelan, you know, we had a lot of you know wine, yeah, whiskeys. Um, even though you know, like I didn't drink until later. Going back and being able to do these, you know, see all the um, the little distilleries that are popping up yeah. and seeing how popular and you know seeing economy ju yep. jump up around there is pretty cool. So, do you have a favorite one? Uh, I, I told you I really like the bullets, Bullet. but um um what are the um they are single malt scotch whiskey. Um Daniel's father, my husband's father, collects uh all different types of uh scotch bourbon, yeah. scotch yeah. so we usually come back with a couple bottles when we come back, but yeah. I um doesn't take much for me to be happy with a glass of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so who's one for you? So, like, do you, do you drink old fashioned? Yeah, those. That's my go-to. So let me ask you this, right? Maybe it's just me, right? From my experience, if I drink old fashioned, is it like the greatest thing ever, or like this is a fucking dish water, right? Yeah, I have yet to have a dish uh, old fashioned. Like, yeah, it's okay, it's all right. It's either like fabulous or like I want a refund. This is fucking yeah. horrible. I've happened. You know, the ones that are horrible, I want the refund, are the ones that use maraschino cherries and loose ice cubes with white sugar. Okay. So the best one I ever had, man, I wish I could remember her name, but she used to work at this bar on, so I, we work used to be on 411 4th Avenue. There's a bar mm -hmm. across from it, the Motif Bar. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, man, um, Sarah, Sarah Compton, right? I remember the one time, best one I ever had, but she would use brown sugar. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wish to add brown sugar. Just like, just like, man, this, yeah. is, this is so tasty, right? Brown sugar's good. Yeah, like, man, can I, can you be my Little perfect? Little cubes, too, they yep. sometimes use those. Like that, man. Can you be my perfect bartender? Like, the best one I ever had. Yeah, I think the best, now, I love old-fashioned, so let me think about the best old-fashioned I've had in Seattle, and hopefully... Um, I would recommend two... Really good old fashioned. Um, 
one is well one's in bellevue i guess it's an ascent prime stake in, in bellevue um but the goldfinch tavern has a really good old-fashioned um and then i you know i just love buying the pre-mixed old-fashioned stuff yeah. at the store the oh, um, i didn't know you could do that yeah they in a safe mind, way, mind blown i know they have small batch. They have bullet that makes their own. Man, with, Woodenville makes their own. With this in your uh, in the Dr Pepper Bluebell, you <laughs> underblown twice. <laughs> well, Jason, this is just you know. I'm glad we were able to to end off on um on a sweet note. Yeah, um, yeah, we definitely gotta do a part two. Like this much, like like how many more crusts? Like like another crust? Like maybe like back at homeless? Like Seattle and Bellevue, maybe ten miles apart, but like both cities are so different, right? So different. It's like it's so night and day. Yeah, it is. It is really. I've worked in Bellevue and Redmond and Seattle, and you know, I I I'm happy to be over here. I yeah. think it's a little more diverse. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. I mean, I like the vibe in Bellevue. You know, like it's just like seeing more business, like right. Yeah, it's cleaner. Yeah, better what costs are right. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I mean, it has, to, it has to be some kind of balance between two cities. Right? Yeah, that'd be some kind of balance. It's um. There's no good solution, Jason. I think, you know, we, it's going to, it, no matter how great or how, you know, what society we want, it takes money. And until people are willing to invest in whatever future they want, good or bad, it takes money. You know, I always say, like, kind of a joke, but it's not like people waste more than me with way more money than me hasn't figured this out yet. Right. So, amen. What am I, what am I doing? Right. All right. So, All right such Sam. a pleasure, Jason. This is, yeah. first of all, let me thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, as somebody who um, has watched your podcast and, <laughs> and, and you know, faithfully sits there on the weekends supporting the founders that you've, well, we know that you've interviewed, um, it was such an honor to be here today. And, you know, you know that if there's ever anything we can do for Cavernous HR or for Jason, um, you know where to find us. And thank it's you. been such an honor. You know, it's still amazing to me, like when people say, and this is my podcast, it's like still like creeps me out right now. <laughs> Or I go somewhere. You're Jason. Do the podcast, right? You do this, right? Like, it still like fucking blows my mind, right? It's crazy. I mean, yeah. I didn't know the governor's office knew about me either. But like, you know, it's when you do things like this, Jason, and consistently demonstrate your commitment to this. Yeah. People, there are other people that recognize. Lesson is you have to put yourself out there. Yeah, right? exactly. Over and over again. I mean, you might put yourself out there doing whatever it is, like two, three years. You might hear crickets, and then yeah, all of a sudden, like. Damn, success bam, bam. emergency yeah <laughs> yeah and all of a sudden you're the overnight success right yeah all right so, channel hey thanks for your time today really appreciate you're it welcome jason to our listeners thanks for your time as well remember to be great every day